So good morning, everybody, uh, wherever you're joining from today, a warm welcome to our East Branch Mini Members Day. Even greater thanks for sacrificing this rain-free morning after all the terrible weather that we've been having. Ideally, we would have liked to meet up in person today for a butterfly hunt in Hollywood Park, followed by a picnic. But sadly, for the second year in a row, we just haven't been able to do this. However, your safety is our top concern, so we've organised some excellent speakers to entertain you until we can all gather in person again. I'm sure you're well aware of the Zoom protocol by now, or better than me anyway, but just to let you know, this meeting is being recorded so that others who couldn't attend uh, can catch up with the show on YouTube. If you have any problems with this, please let us know. You should also know that we speakers can neither see nor hear you. So if you do have a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Or for general chat and technical issues, please use the chat function at the side. Uh, my fellow committee member, Michael, will be keeping an eye on this for you. I like to keep the official business short and sweet so that we can move on to more interesting matters like the talks of the day. So I'm going to give you a very brief overview before introducing our first speaker. If you're joining us for the first time, East Branch is a regional branch of the charity Butterfly Conservation, which covers the Scottish borders right the way up to Grampian and everything in between. We are a friendly bunch of butterfly and moth enthusiasts. And if all this is new to you, we are here to support you on your journey. We can help you to identify butterflies and moths, offer advice on how to plant for pollinators. We can help you to submit records and we can even meet you out in the field as part of an identification workshop. So whatever your level, you are welcome to get involved. But how might you do this exactly? Well, our website might be a good place to start. We have a fantastic set of resources online managed by our webmaster, Mark Cubitt. This is the place to go to find out about events, read our newsletter and brush up on your ID skills. There are some really useful features that a lot of people don't actually know about, like our caterpillar gallery, a moths by month tool and also butterfly distribution maps. One exciting piece of news is that we are working hard behind the scenes to update our distribution maps, which we're getting a little bit old. Uh, so do look out for this appearing in the near future. And huge thanks to Nigel Voden, Mark Hubert and Glenn Edwards for their hard work on this. We've also been working hard to build our social media presence over the past few years in an attempt to reach out to new audiences. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and as of 2021, you can also find us on our brand new Instagram account. This would not be possible without a dedicated team of media volunteers who keep these accounts ticking over for us. So massive thanks go out to them today. Please join us on social media to keep up to date with events and exciting recent sightings. Plus, if there's anything you can suggest to make our accounts more engaging, please do get in touch with me. As well as acquiring some new media volunteers this year, we've also recruited two newsletter editors who've been doing a fantastic job putting together our quarterly publication. They've helped to ensure a reliable newsletter schedule and that news from all corners of the branch gets heard. Our summer newsletter will be published on the 30th of June and you can download it from our website regardless of whether you're a member or not. If you have any new sightings, short articles or photographs that you would like to submit, please do get in touch with our editors who are always looking for new content. We absolutely welcome items from people who have never submitted anything before, so please do get in touch. Last year was obviously very disappointing for us all in terms of our events being cancelled but we're back and ready to go with new opportunities this year, some of which I've been asked to highlight. There is a call for volunteers to help survey Northern Brown Argus in the Sidlaw Hills. Um, this will be working with David Hill. So if you'd like to get uh, involved with that, please um, drop an email either to me, you'll see my email address in a little bit, or using our contact form on the website and we'll point you in the right direction. 
same goes for Northern Brown Argus in the borders. Uh, we're always looking for volunteers. We have um, a huge list of potential sites for Northern Brown Argus that we need to get around. And the butterfly will be on the wing soon, so please do get in touch soon if you're interested in these opportunities. There are also a series of free Zoom workshops advertised on the website at the moment. These include general butterfly identification and recording, a mountain moth workshop, and several workshops on the small blue butterfly. Plans are also coming together for in-person workshops, which will be advertised in the near future, so do keep checking. There's been little change on the committee structure over the past 12 months, but we have said goodbye to one very prominent committee member. After serving the committee for many, many years as chair and then as borders organizer, Barry Prater has officially stepped down from the committee. I think many of us, myself included, can say that we are here thanks to Barry, who has a real knack for enthusing people and encouraging them to get involved in whatever way they can. You may still hear from Barry if you're involved in serving for Northern Brown Argus, so he hasn't disappeared altogether just yet. However, on behalf of East Branch, I would like to thank Barry for his dedication and support. All the best for more time spent out in the field with butterflies and pursuing new hobbies. All is not lost though, as we have Michael Scott replacing Barry as Borders organizer. So an official welcome to you, Michael. Michael is equally enthusiastic and I'm sure he's going to do a great job. There are currently no committee positions vacant. However, I am interested in exploring the idea of a position centered around fundraising. This is something we've never really done in East Branch before, but it's fairly common in other branches. So if you think you're the right person uh, with ideas on how we could raise more money for Scottish conservation projects, do you get in touch with me. Finally, something else I'd like to work on improving is promoting diversity amongst our volunteers, members and committee. If you have any suggestions on how we can reach out to different parts of the community or different age categories, I'd love to hear your thoughts. You can get in touch with me uh, using my email address here or the contact form on the website. Now that's quite enough from me. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, so that my uh, first speaker can set up his slides. So our first speaker is uh, a fellow trustee of Butterfly Conservation, Simon Savile. I've asked Simon to be our keynote speaker today because many of our members live in urban areas. And although this talk fo focuses on London, there's no reason why we shouldn't feel inspired to do something very similar up here. I'm always astounded by Simon's commitment to butterfly conservation. He's worked hard on council, achieved some amazing successes in urban areas, he is committed to the climate fight, and I've also heard he's going on a rather long bike ride for butterflies, which I think he's going to tell us about shortly. So over to you, Simon. Thank you, Pitney. I'll just share my screen. Uh, there we go. So thank you for having me here at uh, uh, East, Br East Scotland branch. Um, as Pitney said, Simon Savile live in London. A um, little bit about me. I was born and bred in the countryside down in Dorset. Um, and that's where I got my love of butterflies, moths in the outside world. Um, since I retired, I've been taking more active interest in butterflies, moths, butterfly conservation in London. Um, and as Pithney said, branch chair of the Surrey and South West London branch of BC, as well as a trustee. Um, been involved in London and its green spaces, and you'll hear about that. Um, and as Pithney said, committed to the climate strife and to XR and what's going on with that. Um, so the talk is about London and Big City Butterflies. Um, the Big City Butterflies project is launching on Tuesday, as you'll hear, um, and I'm, I'm weaving some information about London around the core of the talk, which is about Big City Butterflies. Um, you can see my Twitter handle there, and there's my email address at the end if you want to get in touch. The talk is, is um, uh, includes lots of photos that I've taken mainly with my mobile phone, like this one, um, and I do that specifically, although I've got a, an SLR, I do that specifically to indicate that you don't need fancy equipment in order to um, take half decent photos. So let's get on into the content. What am I going to cover? 
Um, I'm going to talk about butterflies in London. Then I'm going to compare city versus countryside and debunk maybe one or two myths on that. I'll talk about the habitats we've got in London. And that'll be an introduction then to the Big City Butterflies project itself. And then we'll talk a bit about how you can help urban butterflies and moths, um, some conclusions, and then I'll describe my Bike for Butterflies uh, cycle ride, which Epiphany mentioned, and there should be time for Q&A at the end. Um, yeah, these two comets were in Burgess Park this spring, um, and they, were, they landed on the tree trunk and then uh, came together and sat there conveniently for a picture for quite a long time. <clears throat> So a couple of aims of the talk um, are, first of all, to debunk the myth that London is no good for wildlife. And then you could put any urban centre instead of London, they are good for wildlife. And then to encourage people to get out into the cities uh, and green spaces around them and explore and enjoy them, really. Um, and you don't need to go out into the big wild countryside in order to see wildlife, certainly not in London. Um, so let's talk about what butterflies we've got in London, first of all, because people tell me there aren't any butterflies here, but it's not true. Um, some of you may have heard of London National Park City campaign. Um, this was a movement to create London as a national park city, which I'll talk about just in a minute. Um, but they've got a wiki now, and I created this page on London's butterflies because I kept on being asked about them. And I won't go through the whole page, um, but if the wiki address is there. And you can see there are, there are 25, 26 species of butterfly, which you can see pretty much anywhere across London, in, right into the centre. And uh, I, I break them up into different categories, but this is the, the section on the hibernators, which you can see photos I've taken of those um, in the past couple of years in London, um, all from all pretty much from the, uh, the centre of London, actually. <clears throat> One of them, the, the Red Admiral, I think, was in my garden. It run, I love right in the centre. So let's talk just just I just mentioned London National Park City because it's it's um, this is a movement to make London greener, healthier and wilder. Um, it's not a national park like Peak District National Park, it's a, it, but it is a place, it is London the place, it is a movement, a grassroots movement to make London greener, healthier and wilder and it is a vision and it's a, it's a call to action to make London a, a better place for wildlife and for people. Um, and I've been involved in this since its inception in about 2018, and then it became formally uh, endorsed in 2019. And I'm, now, and I'm now a National Park City Ranger, which is a group of 110 individuals who are committed to doing what they can in various ways to, to pursue this goal of greener, healthier and wilder. Um, so we can talk about that if you want. And I think Glasgow is, on, is, a, is trying to follow the same path and become a National Park City as well. So if you get, but the, the butterflies of London have changed, and I think actually they've improved over the last 30, 40 years. There's a, the definitive book is one by Colin Plant back in 87, um, and that lists 21 generalist species, which you could see in London, in inner London, uh, as it was defined then. Um, and all of those are still present with the exception of the wall, which is no longer, which is, as you know, is a subject of national decline, um, but now is absent from London pretty much everywhere. But now we have over um, 25 species in London and the ones I've highlighted here, I'm not going to go through the list uh, one by one, but the ones I've highlighted are ones that have come into London uh, in the last few years and are now seen pretty regularly. So the brown argus, purple hair streak and white letter hair streak probably under recorded in the past anyway. Marbled white and ringlet are now, now seen uh, routinely, um, uh, plus all the other butterflies. Um, so London, London has a good spread of butterflies, um, and we'll talk about that a bit more as we go through. And I'll go through some success stories. Um, we'll talk about the three butterflies on the left, um, which have um, spread in London, and are illustrated below, all pictures from uh, London parks and green spaces. And we'll talk about two particular green spaces, Warwick Gardens and, and Burgess Park. Uh, which I think are, are, are relevant and good exemplars of what can be done and what is being done. So firstly, the white-letter hair streak. Um, this is probably a national story as well as a London story, uh, but it, when Dutch elm hit back in the 70s, the white-letter hair streak suffered really badly because the elm is, of course, their larval food plant. Um, but the elms weren't completely wiped out from the countryside. And, and now if you go around London, you will find elms everywhere and in street corners, in parks, in small groves. Um, and uh, 
they're prominent in the spring in, in March, April time when they're in fruit, particularly. Uh, so we went around and we surveyed the elms in London and then found where they were and then went back to look for the white letters. And you can see the spread here. This is South London. If you know the geography, you've got uh, Westminster up here. You've got places like Brixton, Croydon, Sunbury, etc. So these are these squares um, uh, show where the white letter is what has been recorded in the last few years. Um, and before that, in the preceding years until 2015, only three tetrads, four kilometer squares, two by two kilometer squares, had had, had any um, uh, any white letters in them. So quite a quite a lot of uh, increase, but also probably some extra recording uh, accounting for that. And this is an example of how they tolerate very urban environments. This is a park called Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens. The MI6 building is 150 meters to the left, so it's right by the Thames by Vauxhall Station. This is a stand of New Horizon cultivars, disease resistant elms around a games area, and the white letters survive on this um, quite happily. Um, uh, and they've been there for many years now. It's a good place to go in June, July, uh, if you've got nothing better to do in, in Vauxhall area. Then the, then the marbled white, this is also a national story, but it's spreading across London. And in VC17, which is the Surrey and Southwest London area, it's now found in, in more than two thirds of the tetrads. Actually, it's two thirds of the monads um, as well. Um, and that expansion has been going on for 30 years. Not clear why that's the case, but in London, the availability of suitable habitat, um, uh, grassy areas, wildflower meadows in parks, etc., is certainly meaning that they're present in the parks in, in central London where they weren't before. And they've popped up in parks near me in the last few years. Then the Brown Argus, another familiar story, I think. This is spreading in inner London. It popped into two parks, Burgess Park, which I'll mention quite a lot which is right by Elephant and Castle and Tooting Common further to the west, um, both in a London parks, quite big green spaces. This butterfly was historically um, a down, chalk downland specialist feeding on rock crows. And if you look at its distribution in the State of Butterflies Report 2015, um, its presence really marks um, where there's chalk in the landscape, uh, you know, the, the Chilterns, the South Downs, North Downs, Dorset, Cotswolds, etc. But for some reason, it's it's now able to use geranium species like dove's foot, dove's foot cranebill, cranesbill as its larval food plant, which is much more widespread, and now it's found much more uh, uh, widely across the across the country, including right across London. Uh, I'm told this is an aberration in the the picture on the right. I didn't realise it's an aberration, but Peter Eels said that's an ab, um, so I take his word for it. So the brown argus, another success story. But just a word of caution here, um, I'm talking about changes in distribution. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean changes, increases in, in abundance. And this is data taken from the, the Moth Atlas, which was published in 2019 um, for 104 species over the period to 2016. And you can see I put um, distribution along the, the horizontal axis and abundance on the vertical one, dividing it into four squares and clearly the square you want to be in is the top right where increasing both abundance and distribution, but there's only 21 out of those 104, so a fifth of those species um, of moth are in that quadrant. The majority of the moths are decreasing in, abundant, in abundance, even though some of them are increasing in distribution. Um, and the, the, the extinction quadrant down in the bottom left is where half of the species are, um, which is really quite worrying. Um, so this is probably, is, probably due to availability of habitat and habitat quality um, uh, rather than anything else. So I think we need to be careful when we talk about distribution, not to get confused with abundance, not to think that distribution changes are always purely good news. Uh, and the same is probably true for butterflies as well. I don't have the data quite to hand. <clears throat> now I want to talk about uh, one of the success stories, um, Warwick Gardens, um, which is a tiny park in Peckham. Those of you who remember um, Only Fools and Horses, it was a set in Peckham, an urban part of central London, uh, again, not far from uh, Elephant Castle. Um, this one and a half hectare, four, four acre park um, is a, it's a typical London green space. It's got a, you know, a, a 
child's playground. It's got a dog poo area. It's got um, um, a little orchard. It's got a path that goes through it. It's got hedges around the edge. Um, the lady called Penny Metal, who actually spoke to the National BC AGM in 2019, has done a study. It was six years. Um, it's now more than six years. Um, and in her time there, she's found getting on for six. Now it's getting on for 600 species of insect and spider in this little park. And some of them are rare, and some of them indeed are new to the UK. Um, and she's got a blog. She lists that, lists, lists this all on a blog called Insect Inside, which you can see there uh, the, the the web address for, which is fascinating. And all her pictures that she's put there. Um, uh, she's a graphic designer and she's got an eye for a good photograph um, and she will actually be on um, spring watch uh, during the next during this season uh, which is on right now i'm not sure which day she's going to be on but i've heard her on a, on a podcast talking about her appearance on on uh, spring watch she should be there wasn't there this week i think but should be there next week so if you could if we can have 600 species of insect and spider in a park like this we can have species anywhere in across London. Um, and then Burgess Park, which is a big green space near Elephant and Castle, um, which as you will know is pretty central to London. Um, it's about, uh, it's over 50 hectares, it's about um, uh, a kilometre or so in one direction and uh, 300 metres in the other, so it's oblong shaped. Um, but it's been transformed recently and it now provides a good range of habitats so from pollinator banks to wildflower grasslands scrubby and woody areas and um, the species list has grown to 22 or more now um, and this marble white was seen there in one of the wildflower grasslands they created um, but i've seen uh, the marbled white brown argus small onassic skippers small heath uh, which i don't think were there uh, some years ago and now come in and also you get other insects and birds and bats and so on um, and this is a very good illustration that um, what's good for butterflies is good for other uh, insects uh, and spiders. And if you've got insects and spiders, you'll have birds and bats. And if you've got that sort of thing, you have small mammals as well. So um, this is a, a good news story for wildlife overall. And the council are really committed to it. And this park actually is one of the flagship parks for the Big City Butterflies project, which you'll see in a minute. Now I want to cover city versus countryside um, and debunk this myth that city is bad and countryside is good because that's not the case across the uh, across the across the UK. Uh, so this against the backdrop of a picture of Exmoor, um, I think you're familiar with the causes of insect declines. Um, intensive agriculture driven largely by the Agriculture Act 1947 and I was reading about um, the decline of, of hay meadows by 95% since the first war. Um, and I hadn't realized, I hadn't thought through that the hay meadows were there, or the meadows were there because we, want, we had a lot of horses that we needed to feed and the horses are the main, main source of agricultural power. Um, and the, that drove a lot of um, uh, 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 hay meadows being created. When we no longer needed the horses, the hay meadows disappeared. But anyway, intensive agriculture, one, one driver. The other is development, tarmac and contracts, so roads and buildings and so on. And you're familiar with habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, what de degradation of the habitat that, that remains, changes to management like loss of hay meadows, loss of coppicing, plus chemicals, pesticides, fertilizers and air pollution. And the fertilizers are actually bad because they, they increase the soil richness and you'll see that's a bad idea. And air pollution, certainly in London at least, nitrogen deposition is a problem. So um, soils which were poor become richer. And you add to that climate change and you see what a problem our insects have got to cope with. <clears throat> um, now let's look at look at London. And this is a picture of London, the great city, which I love. Um, it's an unusual angle. Um, and the mast there is of Crystal Palace, Crystal Palace Park. Um, and the woodlands in the middle is part of the Great North Wood, a fragment of an old um, old woodlands that stretch from, from Deptford in the north to Croydon in the south. You can see the Millennium Dome in the distance and Canary Wharf there. But you can see what a varied and, and, and green city London actually is. <clears throat> but if you think about London versus the countryside, um, uh, it's richer in structure. So the countryside tends to be large fields now, um, not much structure and much, not much um, uh, diversity. 
uh, London doesn't suffer from the diversity, the, I'm sorry, the monocultures which you get in agricultural land, big fields of one thing that's the same, it's just a magnet for pests. London also is an urban heat island, so it's, it's four degrees, maybe seven degrees warmer than the surrounding countryside. There's much less fertilizer use, much less pesticide use in London. Uh, the green spaces of a pretty stable footprint, you think of the green spaces being the parks and gardens and cemeteries and whatever, um, these don't tend to change. Um, they may get built close to and maybe more people around them, but the footprint at least stay, stays the same. There's also brownfield sites. They are under pressure for, for de development, but the brownfield sites are really good for wildlife. And um, they are, tend to be more cared for than parts of the countryside. The parks are loved, and a lot of them have friends groups and so on, which, which do a good job. And this is described in this book, The Dis Disappearance of Butterflies by Joseph Reichholf. Um, there's a chapter in there about uh, urban versus countryside. And if anybody wants to have more details on that, I've got it, which I can share. Um, but it's an interesting story. The other thing about London, as you get into London, um, is that uh, London has an environment strategy signed off in 2017, and there's a green infrastructure chapter in it. Um, and it has aims to make more than half of London's area green, protect the national environment, etc. And it talks about London National Park City, but um, it also talks about increasing and improving green infrastructure here. So there is a, uh, a move in London to improve what's there and mechanisms like an urban greening factor for planning, protecting the green belt and biodiversity net gain in planning are mechanisms to, to, um, uh, to try and uh, mean that when, when development happens, which is not going to stop, um, that, that leads to um, uh, an environment which is better than it was before. The image there is from the London Environment Strategy. It's, it's not one of mine. It's the image they use to promote it. <clears throat> Now let's look at, I want to look at London's habitat. This is all building up to a description of why Big City Butterflies works and, and what it's going to be doing as a project. Um, so this is a, a, a map of London, Greater London. Um, the red dot is roughly where Westminster would be. Um, to give you orientate you who are not familiar with London, um, you've got the Thames running through here. Uh, you've got um, uh, Richmond Park and Wimbledon Common in this corner. Uh, Hyde Park, Regent's Park, Hampstead Heath, Lee Valley, um, you know, um, big green spaces. Um, and you can see in the centre, it's much less green. This little green space here is Burgess Park, which we'll talk about more later. But surprisingly, 47% of London is green rather than concrete. 22% um, is green belt. Um, there were 3.8 million gardens, so it's almost uh, every, if one for every second person, um, about a quarter of the total land, land area is gardens. They're not always green, by the way, but at least it's got it's, it's space which isn't built on. Uh, there are over 1600 sinks, we call them sinks in London, some, to some, some other places they're SNCIs or local wildlife sites. These are sites which are de designated by the councils uh, as wildlife sites, um, making up a fifth of the area. 143 local nature reserves and three national nature reserves being um, uh, Ryslip Woods up in this corner, um, Richmond Park, and a new one in the south called um, South London Downs, which stitches up a lot of green spaces down here. And of course, the brownfield spaces. So London is a, is a, is a green city already. Um, obviously, it could be greener, and that's what we're trying to, to make happen. Um, and if you go back to the London Wildlife Trust, which was formed in 1981, the story goes that when uh, when they were forming it, um, they were told, "Don't it's a waste of time. Don't bother. You only find pigeons, foxes, and rats in London." Uh, but how wrong they were proved. The people who said that were proved, because now if you look in the database uh, from Giggle, which is Green Space Information for Greater London, it's a local environmental record centre for London. More than fifteen thousand species have been recorded in Greater London. And actually, as I look out my window now, I'm seeing a holly blue um, and, a, and a small white flitting across the trees here. Um, so 15,000 plus species, and, and this leads to London being actually one of the more biodiverse areas of Britain. It's not a very big area, 1,600 kilo square kilometres, um, roughly, uh, but actually a biodiversity hotspot rather than a cold spot. 
I'll talk a little bit about South London because I know this better than the other parts of London because it's my it's my neck of the woods. Um, but it's a good exemplar of what's 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 available across London in terms of habitats. So I've highlighted in in the red areas here. These are the like the special areas, um, National Nature Reserve, so Richmond Park, Wimbledon Common, and the South London Downs, where the chalk, um, the dip slope of the North Downs just creeps into Greater London. And these are very rich areas. This area in particular down here is very rich in wildlife and has got some sites there which have got 40 plus species of butterfly on them. Um, but referring to the rest of um, London, it's mainly parks, commons, cemeteries, gardens, brownfield sites and transport corridors. Um, and you can see here um, Hyde Park, Battersea Park, Clapham Common and Burgess Park as examples. I'll talk more about Burgess Park. Elephant and Castle somewhere up here. No, somewhere up here, sorry. And the interesting thing about these green spaces is there are very few land managers. It's basically the boroughs. Um, there are 32 boroughs plus the City of London. Um, so you've only got 33 organisations to speak to there. Most of them have a borough ecology officer who's in charge. So you've got somebody specifically to talk to. And alongside that, um, the City of London Corporation owns some sites as well, like Hampstead Heath and some in the south, Epping Forest as well. Um, and then you've got London Wildlife Trust, Trust for Conservation Volunteers, National Trust and Royal Parks as other landowners. Um, and lots and lots of friends groups. All these parks and green spaces have friends groups. and. Uh, uh, they do a great job to help make them greener and healthier and wilder. So there's, there's, there's plenty of, um, there's lots of green spaces and they've got all good management structures, which isn't necessarily the same in the countryside. Um, but there are large areas of deficiency in access to nature. This is an official designation in the London planning system. And it's more than a kilometre walking distance from an accessible borough or mo metropolitan borough site of interest for nature conservation. So you can see Burgess Park here, they said that oblong shaped park near me. This, this, this defines a boundary and, and this sort of brownie area is an area of, of um, uh, deficiency, so diversity, deficiency in access to nature. Um, so there's quite a lot of areas in London where there is a deficiency, which is something which we need to, to bear in mind as we go forward in the project. Uh, now I'm gonna uh, talk about the Big City Butterflies project in particularly now with that background in place. And we're launching it on Tuesday. Um, and uh, this is an example of one of the launch, what I've called launch butterflies. These are made out of old metal containers, about 20 centimeters across these are. And these have been sent out to partners in, in many of the green spaces that we're gonna be using as flagship sites. And they're gonna be hidden, hidden in the, the fixed somewhere and hidden in the parks. And there's gonna be a social media campaign to get people to take pictures and share them. Uh, as you'll see as I go through. <clears throat> so Big City Butterflies, what's it all about? Well, primarily it's there, there to help Londoners discover and connect with butterflies, moths and the green spaces around them. Um, and then to improve the connectivity and quality of the green spaces, increase recording and monitoring and engaging with new audiences. Um, and this last point at the bottom is really important because um, this is the first, apart from the Munching Caterpillars project and Anthony's Helping Hands project in, Glas in the Glasgow area and in, in Southern Scotland. Um, this is the first really big project that BC's had in London um, and we want to test and develop new, new approaches to conservation and in particular engagement in, in these sort of spaces. We're very unfamiliar with doing this type of project. Um, we're accustomed to doing um, habitat management projects in Exmoor or on the Downs or Morecambe Bay or whatever. This is a different type of project. Um, and you can see the four species like the Jersey tiger, marbled white, orange tip and holly blue, which are common um, in London, uh, which are being used. Uh, it is funded by the um, National Lottery Heritage Fund, as you'll see. Um, so the status of it, it's, we did a development year in 2019-20, um, then had a pause for COVID, which actually was, the COVID wasn't a good thing, but the pause actually helped us, I think, um, uh, to get more momentum and build up some of the back, back office stuff that we need to do. As I said, the main sponsor is the National Lottery. Um, it's a big project, £440,000 over four years. Um, the four London branches, um, uh, so Surrey and South West London, Kent and South East London, Hearts and Middlesex and, and Cambridge and Essex um, are all supporting and supporting with funding as well as activities, people. 
The two project officers are on board, Ali Johnston, who's previously from the Bat Conservation Trust, and Steve Bolton, who's just finishing on the Brilliant Butterflies project, which we're on with the National History Museum and London Wildlife Trust. And all the activities are now being planned, as I said, launch on the 2nd of June. Things getting underway, exciting times. Um, so the three themes are recording and monitoring engagement and habitat management. Um, but I think this one is really about engagement. Um, if we're doing recording and monitoring, it's, it's, it's it, the engagement side of that is as important as the data we collect. Um, and the habitat management will be mainly talking to other people like the boroughs to get them to do it rather than doing it ourselves, which has been part of projects elsewhere in the country. Um, these are the, this is the project area. This, uh, you're familiar with the shape of Greater London now and the four branch areas I've mentioned uh, in, in colored there. And we're focusing on the inner London boroughs um, plus Redbridge and Barking and Dag Dagenham because those were ones that the lottery were keen for us to focus on. Um, you can see in my area of South London, I've got Wandsworth, Lambeth and Southwark, which I'll talk about a bit more. Um, so just a bit of, to compare these areas with Scotland, um, so you see the population density, it's quite, when I looked up, I was quite surprised, not only how high the population density is in London, 11,000 people in a London per square kilometer, but how low it is in Scotland. So very, very different um, uh, in terms of density of people. In the London is of course very, very mixed. And if you get into Lambeth, this borough here, where I'm living, 53% um, white ethnicity, according to the, to the statistics I found. And in parts, um, clearly dominantly non-white. So very diverse communities, some very poor communities. Um, so these are communities we haven't been able to reach in the past and find it difficult to reach. And we'll talk about that as well. And it's not a huge area. Um, so Greater London, about 1600 square kilometers. Inner London is about 20% of that, 320 square kilometers. And compare that with Scotland and you can see how much smaller an area we're working with here. Then this is the sort of sites. So you remember you're familiar with pictures of the countryside around you and then show you've seen pictures of Exmoor and etc. But this is the sort of thing we've got in London. So you've got allotments on the top right, you've got little green spaces in, in uh, transport areas and transport corridors, you've got green, you've got wild wild wildlife areas in parks, like this one in a park near me. Then you've got areas which are just left corners which are which are which are wild. Where wildlife can thrive. So um, very different types of area compared with um, what we're typically used to dealing with. And of course, all these are under management by somebody else. Um, so we, we have to work with them, those people to get the habitat management done. Um, and we, we, work, we worked on a number of flagship sites. And this is again, the map of London with the flagship sites located in the dots with Westminster with the red. So we wanted to there to be some butterflies and moth present in the flagship sites with the opportunity for more. We wanted them to be a variety of different types of site, different management practices. We wanted them to be good for access so that they weren't, so that anybody could get there, but also they had facilities so you could run events. So rooms to hire, toilets, cafes, etc. And we wanted there to be community groups, volunteer groups associated with them, largely friends groups and so on. And these are the sites we, we uh, selected. I'm not expecting you to recognize these except for some like maybe Hyde Park, you'll know, um, the big space. Some spaces like Miwar Gardens are very small. Burgess Park near me is 50 odd hectares, they're very big. Some like Oxley's Meadow are quite rural. rural. Uh, others um, like Barbican Estate are extremely urban. So um, each one in per borough. Um, and these are, these are the flagships where we'll focus events. And around these, you've got smaller sites with particular um, things which we can do in them. Um, uh, we call their satellite sites. So the engagement work, again, it's subject to COVID, but there were a lot of outreach to schools. You can see May Weber there, she was the development officer with the school, mostly uh, primary schools, key stage two is the target, not into secondary schools, high schools, um, but a program of schools, school engagements, community events. So this was a moth trapping, uh, so-called moth breakfast we did in one of the parks. Um, run a moth trap overnight uh, and, and collect people together uh, to talk about moths in the morning. 
public events so where there, where there is an event having a stall or a stand there and engaging with the public showing some live moths etc i talk about what we're doing and engaging with an organization called wild in the city um, which is important um, this is this is run by a lady called beth collier it's a charity um, and um, they engage with um, communities in london and it's a particularly communities which are uh, from ethnic minority groups um, although those are largely as i said majority groups in in london and we did a workshop and sadly i couldn't attend this i was um i think at a bc council meeting um and you, you can see the web address for wild in the city there um uh, but you can see it's nathan from kent branch uh, malcolm from uh, hearts middlesex um there's kate merry from bc may weber who is the the development officer and Russell Hobson from BC um, and you can see this was getting this is out in the um, London's uh, green spaces some some um, woodland area I can't remember exactly where it was down in South London um, uh, but challenging the group to think about diversity and its impacts and and um, what they could do to be more it'd be more inclusive of other audiences um, and we've got some workshops and activities with Wild and City planned as part of the project. Um, we, we, I think, um, because of the the much high levels of diversity we have in London versus other parts of the country, this is something with which we'll, we will hit head on um, and won't be able to avoid it. And I'm hoping that the lessons we learn we can we can um, feed out to other parts of the country and to um, BC more generally because it is a problem in our sector that we are so middle class white. Um, and we need to change that, obviously. Um, recording and monitoring, I said here, setting up some mo recording monitoring schemes, having identification workshops, IDs, and lots of materials created. The new um, iRecord app will obviously be helpful here, because it's got, it's got a lot more stuff in it than they used to have. Um, but I think a lot of these recordings and monitoring activities will be there in a way which encourage engagement, so these engagement opportunities as well. And then in terms of habitat management, this is about um, getting getting in touch with the land managers, the boroughs, uh, and their and their um, contractors who manage these sites. Uh, talking about this is Phil Stirling talking about uh, wildflower meadow creation in urban areas, um, visiting sites, giving advice of what what could be done. Um, because it's not it's not that difficult to to um, to make the parks greener and better for wildlife. I'm going to skip over this one um, and just talk about the launch. So here you can see there's a there's a butterfly here in a park. There's one here on this this clock tower. So hopefully where people can't nick them because um, people things tend to walk if you um, um, don't have them nailed down. But the idea is that people um, take photos of these, share on social media, um, and we have a bit of a buzz around. Um, what's going on with the launch of Big City Butterflies. Uh, now, so part of this is about helping urban butterflies and moths. Uh, so what can we do? Um, and this is, a, you probably know this, but this is a chart I've used with some other groups because um, people are surprised this about how butterflies spend the winter. They ask me this quite a lot. And this chart um, just shows for the, 24 species breeding in inner London, did a quick check. And you've got, of course, the five adults, five that hibernators adults, which you're familiar with, the peacock, small tortoiseshell, um, uh, red admiral, brimstone, and small uh, comma. Um, but only three of our butterflies spend the winter as an egg. That's the two hair streaks we've got, the purple and the white letter, and the Essex skipper. Six is a chrysalis. Um, that's mainly the whites. Uh, but surprisingly for people, um, nearly half of those species spend the winter as a caterpillar, which means that how you treat the green green spaces and the foliage in the green spaces in the autumn, late summer, autumn, is really important if you're going to protect these caterpillars because they're very vulnerable at this stage. Um, and I, I like to use these these five things for what, what people can do and there's, there's a lot more um, good content actually on the action for insects, insects uh, stuff on the wildlife trust. Um, in small spaces, nectar for adults all through the season. London has a very long season, um, so providing nectar 
uh, and pollinated plants is important, but also what I call feeding the kids. Uh, so caterpillar food plants, uh, important. I'll, I'll go on to that in a minute. Um, and then shelter for overnight and for the winter. So thinking about what, what butterflies and moths need over winter. Um, here I make a plea for ivy, not to get rid of the ivy because it's really good, not just for the holly blue, but for plenty of other um, uh, sheltering insects. And of course, no chemicals, because um, uh, and that means not, not only insecticides, but also no, no fertilizers. Um, and then a pond, if you can, how a small will increase the diversity of what you've got. Um, and again, the storyline that good for insects is good for other wildlife is important to, to emphasize here. And that's what we, this is what we tell park managers um, as they're going through the, these sort of discussions. We've had discussions in my area now with, with the people in, in Southwark Borough, and we've got sessions for the project in the other two boroughs in my area coming up in a, in a week or so's time. Very positive, and they're all keen to get involved and help and do, do more. So the list of food plants for London's butterflies, the caterpillars of London's butterflies, is actually pretty short. And I've made it a list of 10. Um, it's a bit of cheating here, as you can see, but um, the grasses for most of the brown butterflies, um, things like cogsfoot or fescues, bents, um, not rye grasses, but the, the, the more, more um, um, other ones. So grasses, you get in wildflower meadows, nettles in sunny patches. Um, and a lot of the parks now have nettle, nettle stands of nettles out of the way where so kids don't get stung. Um, and you can regularly see peacock caterpillars on there in the summer. Nasturti nasturtiums and brassicas for the whites, birds for trefoil, vetches and lucerne for the blues. Um, a lot of the parks now put lucerne in, I don't know why, but that seems to be used by a lot of the blues here. Garlic mustard and cuckoo flower for the for the orange tip, sorrel and dock for the uh, small copper, dust for cranesville or geranium species for the brown argus, thistles for the painted lady, ivy for the holly blue, and then oak for purple hair streak, buckthorn for uh, brimstone and elm for white letter hair streak. So we have conversations with the um, borough ecology officers and encourage them to include these plants, and they do. And in particular, we've got a lot more authorities now planting buckthorn and elm and we know this is a matter of uh, build it and they will come. Um, so in London what we've been doing is building relationships with borough ecology officers. Um, so I know we know the ecology officers in Wandsworth which is um, a borough uh, just to the east of west of here and this park called King George's Park is about a kilometre long or a mile long and it goes along the Wander River which is a fast flowing river the tributary of the Thames joins in it, joins the Thames at Wandsworth Town. Um, you can see it's an ordinary urban park with play areas and facilities and whatever. And the ecology officer asked me, what, what could they do? They're having a revamp of the park. What could they do for wildlife? So I wrote a note um, to follow on talking about what butterflies were nearby, what could be done, what the experience had shown. Um, and that's available should you want to see it. It's, 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 um, I can make it available to anybody if they would like to. Um, uh, and encouraging them to do more of this. So this is the park near me, and I know it's a winter picture versus a summer picture, but believe me, this was best amenity grassland in three, four years ago, and now is a wildfly meadow in the summer. And then when I've been having film crews out who wanted to do big city, uh, uh, big butterfly count launch, take them here, and this, this is buzzing with marbled whites and and common blues and meadow browns and all sorts of skippers and so on. It's a lovely place in the summer. Um, and I think you probably know this as well, but creating flower rich meadows and grasslands is very pertinent in a lot of the parks. And the key to this is low nutrient soils. And I use this picture here. This is, this is down on uh, a site near Croydon on the chalk. Uh, but you can see this is where the, on the left hand side where the topsoil was scraped away. And on the right where it wasn't scraped away, and uh, this was done four years ago, I think. So there's been no cutting or maintenance of this area at all. Uh, and on the right-hand side, this has been cleared at least once, probably twice, um, with, with put, trying to get rid of the dogwood and it, it's impossible. And this is because this soil is too fertile um, and you need low fertility soils. Um, and you can, you can generate that by cut and collect mowing um, where you let the grass grow long, cut it and take the arisings away 
and each time you 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 cut and collect the arisings, you take the nut nutrients which have come out of the soil into the greenery uh, removed, and over a period of a year or two, you can you can get to quite quite um, poor soil fertility, and then you can seed with a flower mix and um, uh, get a wildflower meadow, and that's been proved in Dorset and adopted across. Uh, many places and this is Phil Sterling's work which you can see here also the plant life better verges campaign and the Nomo May is in the same vein uh, but it, that's a big thing for our parks in London and presumably elsewhere in the country as well um, and what we found as we go through the parks is that um, there's no reason why most parks couldn't support 20 species of butterfly um, in London if you've got a park more than Bigger than a couple of football pitches, it's quite possible that, that could support 20 species of butterfly with the right management. So some wildflower meadow areas, wild corners, a bit of planting, maybe some buckthorn here, some garlic mustard there, maybe some lucerne or bird's foot trefoil, whatever. Um, and I'd like to see this as a target for all parks in London and maybe all parks across the country. Um, and I mocked up this concept logo, it's not official, but the concept of a butterfly friendly park being one with more than 20 species of butterfly in it and I think that would be something which people would would align behind because we'd have more wildflower meadows more pollinator banks more hedges and scrubby areas more caterpillar food plants more oaks elms and buckthorns um, and less of the things we don't want chemicals and grass marrow and so on um, so that's um, I think a target and that's that, that was what I'd like to see it's not an official BC um, program yet I think I'd like to see it become one uh, and be rolled out and we're going to pilot this in the big city butterflies project in London and see whether we can um, get this to stick. So in conclusion, and, and I'll leave some time for questions, I've got one or two things to go through. Um, London is good for wildlife and good for butterflies. Um, the, the project big city butterflies offers plenty of opportunities for people to get involved and there are lots of simple and cheap things that people can do. And what's good for nature is good for us as well. So we use these Big City Butterflies hashtag and Nature Under Our Noses hashtags as well. So now a bit of, with that, I'm going to do a bit of shameless self-promotion. So excuse me while I talk about my Bike for Butterflies ride. Um, uh, I'm doing a sponsored ride from the, the length of the country, from Land's End to John O'Groats, starting on the 22nd of June. It's taking 30 days, 1,200 miles, 40 miles a day. And I'm going to be visiting as many nature reserves as I can on the way, promoting the need to take care of nature and raising money for BC. And there's a, my website at the bottom and the Just Giving page there. So um, uh, what, there's a couple of things which I'd ask you to do if you'd like to, and obviously give money is helpful, but promoting the ride and getting more people to be aware of it and, and uh, um, uh, give money outside the normal givers will be really, really good. Or joining me on the way, if, uh, if you can, this is my route is on the Bike for Butterflies website, but you can see the route I'm taking through um, uh, Scotland. Uh, the, the map on the right is not actually correct. It's the it's an example from the Sustrans National Cycle Network route, uh, but you'll notice that it doesn't that route doesn't go to Stirling, so it misses out west of Moss, um, and it takes a slightly different route across the flow country as well. Um, that's because I couldn't get the accommodation I wanted. Um, but I am going to be popping into Wester Moss uh, if I'm not too late for large heath. Um, I will be going to King Gussie, maybe doing a moth trap there um, and um, on up to John and Groats, hopefully on the 21st of July. Um, so, you know, join me if you can. Um, look at the website. BC are promoting this. It'll be in the Butterfly magazine, which will come out just about the time that I start the ride. Um, I've got a flag to go on the back of the bike um, and I've done a bike ride this morning, an hour and a half, so I'm trying to get in training, hard work. I was going to do it last year, so it's been a very long training program. Um, so there we are. And now just in conclusion, for leave time for Q&A, um, I need to acknowledge all the work done by BC, of course, all the volunteers who've done either monitoring work or you know, outreach work or um, habitat work all the friends of groups who are involved in the parks around here, all the boroughs. And if you want more information on any of these, um, there's two talks I'd draw your attention to. One is Kate Mary's talk on big city butterflies and the other is Phil Sterling's talk on wildflower meadows. 
both of these are available on the, our website, uh, the Surrey Branch website, which is the link there. And again, thanks to the National Lottery Heritage Fund for the, for the funding that we've got um, for the project. And that's a final thank you. You've got my details there, my email address, which is pretty easy to remember, and the uh, my Twitter handle there if you want to get involved and a nice picture of a small skipper in Burgess Park. So with that, I'll, st I'll stop sharing and be ready for questions, Epiphany. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, that was a really interesting talk. And as I mentioned before, many of our members are based in urban areas and will be able to connect with this idea that cities are extremely biodiverse and that they, they go out looking for wildlife all the time and are often successful. I'm thinking in particular of Holyrood Park in Edinburgh. Um, I know that I could go there and see more butterflies than I could in the very intensively farmed area of the countryside that I live in. Um, so it's certainly given me a lot to think about, um, particularly as Edinburgh has a similar percentage of, of green space in terms of land cover. So there's definitely things that we could be replicating up here. Uh, indeed, somebody has put that in the comments as well. Uh, Bruce has said, very interesting talk where all of these ideas can be easily re replicated in our cities, such as Edinburgh, Dundee and Aberdeen. Yeah. So we don't have any other questions, but I have one. Um, I'm really interested in this idea of the, the London City Park. And I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how that came about, how it was established, how long it took, et cetera. Yeah, so London National Park City, um, it was really the brainchild of a guy called Daniel Raven Ellison, who is a, a he calls himself a guerrilla geographer. Um, he's a big character, um, but but he, 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 he he visited all the national parks in England and, and got thinking about this and realized that um, why isn't why does that not include any urban landscapes? Because the urban landscapes are, are where most of the people live. And his view, and of course, you know that the national parks in England in the in this country weren't created mainly for wildlife, they're for the for the um, uh, um, they're there for the landscapes um, and they're not necessarily very good for, for wildlife. Um, but he had this idea that why couldn't London be a national park? And they went through all the thinking about, well, it can't be because the National Parks Act says it has to be blah, blah, blah. Um, so then he came up with the idea of why can't it be a national park city? Why can't it make the, the city a national park, um, a different type of national park? And that started a grassroots campaign. People got involved, they did crowdfunding. Um, and then they got the GLA to support the concept because it was about greener, healthier, wilder. Um, and then as they were leading up to the campaign to, to go live, as it were, in July 2019, with all the volunteers, myself included, were there to, to get the majority of the wards in, in the boroughs in London to officially support. And that was done. So they got more than 50% of the borough of the wards to support. It tended to be nearly all the Labour boroughs and all the Lib Dem boroughs and the Tory boroughs were much more resistant, worried about costs and other things. Um, uh, but we got that support and then there was a launch ceremony in 20, um, 2019. And it's, it's an odd thing because it's a combination, as I said, of a place, um, a vision um, and, a, and, a, and a call to action, if you will, to be greener, healthier, wilder. Um, uh, and it's now got its own momentum. It's got its own, got a couple of employees who are the range of coordinators. Um, it's got a, it's got a trustee body and it's working with other cities across the world to create a network of national park cities. Um, and Glasgow is one is hoping to be the second one. Um, uh, we don't know if it will be, but I might get beaten. Um, but I th for me, it's mainly a grassroots movement that says our city can be better. And if you look at the, if you go onto the National Park City website and look at the range, list of ranges, you'll see the huge diversity of individual you've got there, from young to old, from rich to poor, um, all sorts of ethnic diversities, um, all sorts of activities. Some based on, on um, a location, some based on like like my case, more species. Some based on a project. Um, some based on artwork, some based on nature, some based on engagement work, um, and uh, uh, just lots of activity going on. And I think it's it's a way of kind of um, 
connecting and, and catalyzing the activities which were going on already and giving them some sort of purpose to uh, um, uh, make more progress more, more quickly, I guess. Absolutely. It sounds like a fantastic shared vision. I've got one question in the chat now from uh, James, who says, do you have a good source of information for making pollinator banks? <clears throat> um, there's plenty of, actually, I think probably the Butterfly Conservation website is where I go for that. Um, uh, I think the, the, you need to think through what you want to encourage. Um, uh, and I think if you've, if you've got enough space for, um, to have enough variety, then you can include things like garlic mustard and birds for truffle and whatever else is larval food plants. Um, uh, but I would probably go on the BC website or the plant life website for those active, those things. There's plenty of stuff there. Um, but thinking about the provenance of the seeds you use, where they come from, um, and making sure they're not treated with neonicotinoids and that sort of thing. Um, um, because you, there were supermarkets and, and garden centers selling bee-friendly plants when the seeds that they were grown from had been treated with neonics, which is a bit of a dead loss, really, as a bee-friendly plant. Um, uh, and of course, bees, as you know, are much more sensitive to neonics than most other insects because they eat the pollen where the neonics get concentrated. So I don't, I don't have a specific resource, but um, um, BC website. There is lots of information on wildflower meadows, by the way, which I think is relevant. And Phil Sterling's the source for that. Great. I should have said actually, Epiphany, that if anybody wants any of the slides or any more information on behind any of the slides, then they can just get in touch. They're freely available. Um, that would be great. I was thinking actually the letter that you showed might be uh, really useful for some people wanting to get in touch with <clears> their local council. In fact, we have a, a question from David Lampard saying, um, my, my local council are addicted to mowing parks and grass verges. Any ideas how to persuade them not to because they don't, they seem to ignore any representations from local residents. Yeah, there is, there is a problem with the tidy brigade. Um, we have that in London as well. When parks get left, people um, complain. Um, I think there, the one one angle is the climate change angle because actually wildflower meadows are a good way of, of storing carbon um, compared with just mowed grass. So um, there's some research on that. Um, and actually, you know, probably better than planting trees to be honest. But that's a that's a whole separate separate topic which uh, <laughs> I don't need to get into. Um, I think this notion that that um, what's good for wildlife is good for people is one to get across. So if you've got butterflies, you will have other insects. If you've got other insects, you will have birds. If you've got birds, you will have um, um, and, uh, small mammals and so on. Um, so all that, that sort of, uh, uh, what's the word, um, good ecology, good for people is important. And I think doing things like um, mowing the edges of the area so that it looks like it's tended rather than, rather than leaving the, the unmown areas go right up to the edge, then it looks as if nobody's done anything mowing paths across so you've got desire lines and so on is important um, and explaining to people why it's being done you know um, uh, is important and then for the councils specifically it is cheaper not to mow so once you've and Phil Sterling has got lots of case studies from Dorset which are applicable of course across the country um, uh, showing that you've got to invest in a bit of different machinery and you have to find someone to dispose of the arisings. Those are two issues that you can't even get away from. Um, but if, but once you've invested in the machinery, you will save money. It is much cheaper not to mow than it is to mow. And the problem becomes, what do you do with the people when you when they're not mowing the, the grass? You have to find something else for them to do. But that's that's normally not been a problem. Um, and they've done it without redundancies in Dorset, I think. So, um, so those are a few thoughts that might help um, that argument. Great, thank you, Simon. I'm just reading some of the questions that popped up. Um, one of them, let's see, uh, somebody is commenting on how good graveyards can be um, yeah. for wildlife. Uh, I think this person perhaps lives in, in the countryside and she's saying um, many of the graveyards there have been left to go well. And is, is, are you finding that this is the case in urban areas as well? They're really good for wildlife. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And we've, 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 what we're, um, God's Acre, as it was called, there's a project on that. Um, uh, so small cemeteries can be great and, and getting the, the church councils to, uh, parish councils to, to um, understand that can be important. We, we had a couple of engagement with, with people who wanted to do big butterfly count in their churchyard or graveyard. And, and um, that was good because that meant that they were then thinking about leaving the ivy, leaving some areas green. But in London in particular, you've got some, some big cemeteries, it's called the Magnificent Seven, which are cemeteries created in the Victorian times when London was getting full of people and not enough graveyard space. So Tower, Ham, Tower Hamlet Cemetery Park, Brompton, West Norwood, Nunhead Cemetery, um, Highgate Cemetery, um, Abney Park Cemetery, and one other I can't remember. And these are typically large areas of 50, 50 hectares or more, which have often gone partly wild and are nature reserves and they're really, really good for wildlife. Um, so it can be, and, and we are in touch with a lot of them. And in fact, um, some of those were the sites we use for the, for the project. Um, and there are transex walks on some of them as well in London. And there's often the biodiversity hotspots. Sometimes they're the places where the peregrine falcons are. We've got more peregrine falcons in London than you have in the, in the Lake District National Park because they like the tall buildings as uh, pretend cliffs. Yes, and for anybody in Edinburgh, uh, Gravia, um, Greyfriars Kirkyard is really good. They actually have a, a wildflower area in there. It's really nice. Um, it'd be nice if we could work with other churches across the city to do something similar. Yeah. Um, I've got a question here saying, um, uh, just your experiences of how you can diversify participation in projects like this, I suppose, different community groups. And another, a, a quick question for me as well. Did you see increased participation during lockdown, more people getting in touch with you about butterflies? Um, so the second one first, yes, we did. Um, <clears throat> where we did in that small gap where we had butterfly walks in the summer, um, and all the controversy about what was allowed and what wasn't allowed. Um, there were people who'd never been on butterfly walks before coming out. And I was down at one of our sites in South London called Hutchinson's Bank um, in the week. And there was a lady there who lived around the corner who, who had never been to the, the site before, lived next door. And through going there, through the lockdown, talking to people who knew about the butterflies and the other things on the site, became addicted to it and, and was now um, really, um, really engaged. Um, <clears throat> the other part of the question was about diversity and engaging communities. Um, I think the, the, the problem for, for BC is that um, people like to engage with people who they think are like them. So when, when people look at the BC people and, uh, you know, they don't see someone who is like them, they see white middle class. That's really difficult to get through that. So, so <clears throat> what we've found most effective, I think, is to work with the, the schools and the uh, friends groups in these areas, which are, which are mixed um, in terms of their diversity um, and use their introduction, if you will, to, to get connected to people who wouldn't otherwise see. So once you get the connection, it's fine. Um, but you've got to get past that initial hurdle. Um, a lot of the schools that May Weber identified as targets were um, in poor areas or mixed areas. And so maybe majority non-white, and you can see some of the pictures I showed were that. Some of the friends groups, um, some of the parks in London are posh and some are not posh. And if you go to the not posh ones, they have a not posh friends group. Um, and that's a way to get into those other communities. So Burgess Park is in a fairly, um, um, uh, what's the word? deprived area of London. It's next to the Aylesbury estate, which when it was built, was the biggest housing estate in Europe. Um, and it's a very mixed population around there. You, the park was rammed with people in the summer, you know, and you get you get all sorts of nationalities. Um, there's usually a there's usually a, a big festival to celebrate Eid uh, at the end of Ramadan there. Um, you know, so the opportunity is there. We, I can't say we've, we've cracked it. Um, but I think with this project, we, we, it will hit us head on because we'll be in communities where that's what the, that's what the people are, you know, they're not, they're, they're not middle-class white, you know, so we'll have to hit, we'll have to address it, which is good. Looking forward to it. 
Yeah, hopefully you're going to find out some really interesting things and you'll be able to share best practice with other other uh, branches of butterfly conservation. Okay, so. I'm going to ask one more quick question before we have a little break. Um, Kirsty says, have you had any brownfield sites adopted specifically for wildlife rather than for building developments? Um, <clears throat> tough one. Um, <clears throat> I've seen the opposite happen, brownfield sites. Um, some of the brownfield areas actually appear in 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 parks. I, I don't think I've seen any. Oh, um, well, maybe Burgess Park itself was it was actually an industrial area that got turned into a park 40, 40 years ago, um, 50 years ago, maybe. Um, no, it's not very common. And I think brownfield sites are where I said that the footprint is stable. I think brownfield sites with Achilles heel in places like London, because the planning system views them as low quality available land. Whereas in fact, they're often the highest quality for biodiversity. As you, if you read Dave Goulson's books, he talks about sites in London. And now you've got Swanscombe out in, in uh, Kent, you know, which is a brownfield site, uh, risk of development for, for a theme park. Um, <clears throat> so, I don't think so, um, and that's a, that's a bigger challenge because the, the, the planning system protects parks, but doesn't protect brownfield very well. Um, so I don't think I can't. I'll, I'll continue to ponder, but I don't think I've got any examples of that. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, a few people saying great talk in the in the comments or sharing um, their experiences. Helen is talking about. Um, how Phil Sterling came up to Aberdeen and did a series of workshops up there with the, the council. So she says things are changing up there, which is great to hear. Yeah. So, huge thank you again for, uh, for speaking to us today. It was really interesting, really inspiring. And hopefully some of us are um, yeah, feeling inspired to do some similar things up here. So we're going to take um, a quick break now just so you can grab a fresh coffee and we'll start again sharp at uh, 20 past 11 with our next speaker. So we'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you. Grab a fresh tea or coffee during the break. Our next speaker is going to be Chris Stamp, who is well known within our community and is a particularly active uh, butterfly recorder and volunteer. Whenever I hear about Chris, it's usually in relation to one species in particular, and I'm extremely pleased that Chris has agreed to join us today and tell us all about his purple hair streak adventure. Over to you, Chris. Thank you very much. Um, I'll share my screen now. Okay, hopefully you can see that's okay. Yeah, that's great. Chris, yep. So just to introduce myself, first of all, so I'm not a conservation professional by any means. I'm a, I actually work in video games, which is obviously quite a long way away from conservation, but um, I've been interested in butterflies since I was a small boy. So I've picked up a fair amount of knowledge over the years. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about um, purple hair streaks. Um, as I think quite a few people have been following my adventures with purple hair streaks over the last year or so. So I'm going to recap and update um, what I've been learning and uh, what I've been up to over the last few months. Um, so I was actually the um, butterfly recorder for the East Scotland branch up to the Millennium Atlas. So I do have a, a kind of a history with the branch. Um, in fact, I was the first recorder. It was a new branch back in those days. So I was the first recorder when, when the East Scotland branch was uh, created. Um, so my my involvement in, in recording in Scotland is a bit intermittent. You know, some, some years I'm very active, some years I'm not so active, depending on work. In particular, I've spent a couple of years abroad in Black Forest in Germany and in uh, next to the Alps in Switzerland. So I missed, missed a few years. So lots of lots of interesting butterflies, but uh, not contributing to Scottish recording um, during that period. But actually last year, um, 2020, was, was, a, was a very good year for me in terms of Scottish butterfly recording. Um, partly I was in between projects and had a bit more free time. Um, partly was working from home when I was working. And the lockdown, ironically for me, the lockdown was very productive uh, for, for butterfly recording. Now, I'm lucky, lucky enough to live in, a, in an area surrounded by nice habitats. Um, so, so I've got things like Northern Brown Argus, Grayling, Dark Green Fertillery, Green Hair Streak, all, all within 
a mile of, of my house, so it's easy for me to to go out and uh, and, and see a range of our kind of local specialities. Which um, and actually last year I. I kind of discovered a lot about my local area. I was kind of guilty of jumping in the car at weekends and going off to see um, butterfly sites. Um, but when we we're enforced to kind of stay local, I actually discovered a lot more um, interesting butterflies just through walking around my local area than, than, I, than I ever realised was there and, and managed to record quite a few new discoveries. And um, Purple Hair Streak was the, was the biggest of, the, of those new discoveries, which is why I've been focusing on that most recently. So, um, so why talk about purple hair streaks? So purple hair streaks, um, there's a few reasons why it's a particularly interesting butterfly. Um, it's an unfamiliar species for most people. I guess some people will have seen purple hair streaks, but they won't have uh, had good views of it or seen it very often, um, possibly come across it briefly by accident and not really being quite sure what they're seeing. So it's, um, so it's a species where you know, I can share what I've learned over the last year and it might uh, help, help people uh, get a little bit more familiar with it. The habitats are unusual, uh, which is part of the reason why people are not so familiar with them. You're not likely to, if you're going out for a kind of a, a, a weekend butterfly spotting expedition, you're not likely to see a purple hair streaks. You kind of have to know uh, what you're looking for and how to recognize them. So it's useful to, to have a few tips on, on, uh, on this particular species. Um, again, because, because they're tricky to spot, there's significant new discoveries to be made. Um, they're very, very under-recorded in Scotland, which is something I discovered uh, last year and, and a few other people who were following my, my recording expeditions um, also discovered the same thing. They were able to go out and find these butterflies locally um, when they're not, not suspected that the butterflies were present at all. So and I think that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg. We'll, we'll be able to make um, a lot of new discoveries with a little bit more knowledge and a little bit of targeted effort on this particular species. And a year ago, I, I knew very little about this species at all. Um, so, so yeah, it's, I think it's, it's the same situation could apply to a lot of people who even people who are quite familiar with butterflies learning a bit more about this species would, would kind of open open up a, a lot of new possibilities um, another bonus with purple hair streaks is uh, that you can actually look for them in the winter uh, they're one of the species which overwinters as an egg um, so if you if you need a, a kind of a fix of, of butterflies over the winter when the weather's dismal and the days are very short you can actually go out and look for purple hair streaks by um, egg hunting and although butterfly egg hunting is is never easy purple hair streak relatively speaking is not too bad it's uh, the kind of white eggs um, on the tips of oak twigs um, so you can you can get familiar with them and you can find them and you can even discover new colonies um, through through egg hunting. And another bonus is it's, it's an after work butterfly. Uh, so people like me who, who go through periods where they're very, very busy working and you can't necessarily kind of head out to the countryside when uh, when it's sunny during the day, the purple hair streak actually flies in the evening. So even if you're very busy during the day, you can actually still go out there and, and record purple hair streaks. Um, so I mentioned that there's a lot of new discoveries to be made around purple hair streaks. So this is a, a distribution map of the current known distribution of purple hair streaks in Scotland. Um, this was provided by um, Patrick Cook at Butterfly Conservation. So the purple dots here, this is a 10k square map. The purple dots show the current um, BC um, distribution mapping. The orange dots here are dots that I've added. Uh, the, the, the data that Patrick provided was up to 2017. So I've added a few dots based on various sources of information where I know there have been additional Purple Hair Street records on top of that database. And this map here shows what I think the more likely actual distribution is. Uh, everywhere where I've put uh, an open circle here, I'm pretty confident that there's purple hair streaks in that 10k square and they just haven't been recorded yet. Um, so there's plenty of scope for people to go out there and put an extra dot on the map. Um, the question marks here are quite fascinating. Uh, there's some kind of old hints of records up in Murray, down in the borders. There's been nothing for, for, for decades in these areas. Um, there's plenty of habitat. Uh, there's no real obvious reason why the, the butterflies shouldn't be there. So it's very possible that the, the species is under, under recorded to the extent that there could be some very, very surprising records and completely new areas, new county records, I would imagine, 
during 2021, we could easily come up with some, uh, some new county records. Um, so, so the habitat of purple hesterix, so the most obvious one is, is Oakwoods. This is uh, King Clavin, uh, Blue Bellwood, not too far from, from where I live. Um, so, you know, classic, very nice oak wood with, uh, with bluebells carpeting the ground. That's, that's the, the typical, the optimal purple hair streak habitat. This is my twin boys when they were younger, walking around in uh, King Clavin Wood. And this is, this is another habitat which I discovered um, last year. It's also very, very suitable for purple hair streaks. This is um, hedgerow oaks. Uh, this is a... Uh, just a few hundred meters away from my house, and I would never have suspected that this was a purple hair streak habitat until, until I made some discoveries uh, in 2020, which I'll describe in a, in a bit more detail in a few minutes. And the most surprising of all to me, this is uh, also purple hair streak habitat. So this is uh, this is our house. Uh, and this is an oak tree outside on the verge. So effectively, purple hair streaks are in our garden, which is something I would never have never have suspected. Um, we've lived in the house since 2008. Um, and it was 2020 when we first discovered that we had uh, purple hair streaks in, um, in our garden. So that then that's for somebody who's a fairly dedicated butterfly recorder. So you can imagine how under recorded it is um, elsewhere where, where people are not so aware of butterflies, but uh, they, they could be in a lot of new places. So the behavior, um, purple hair streaks are active in the evening, which is very important for people to know. You know, you do, do hear about people spending a lot of time trying to find purple hair streaks. And then uh, when you realize that they were out during the day, it's, it makes life much, much harder. It's not impossible to see them during the day, but it's much more difficult. Um, if you go out at evening, typically 5 p.m. onwards, then that's when you start to see them. That's when they become active. So again, that's another reason why you're unlikely to, to come across them when, you, when you're out there looking for on, a, on kind of more general butterfly expedition. Purple hestrics are just not going to be active um, at the time when you're looking generally. It's a tree treetop species, which is another reason why people don't come across them very often. You have to be looking up, not down. Um, when, when you're looking out, doing a butterfly scouting trip, you're going to be looking down mostly. Um, but yeah, purple hair streaks and one or two other things, you need to be looking upwards. So the males stay high up, uh, dashing around the, the outer canopy. The females do occasionally descend uh, because they lay eggs at, at um, various levels. You, know, you can find eggs on the trees at kind of two meters height, so proof that they do descend, um, but you have to be lucky. You have to be spending a lot of time waiting for them or uh, be very lucky to actually see one coming down to, the, down to that level. Um, they, they can descend for nectar. I've never seen it myself. I think it's something that happens in uh, drought conditions, maybe where there's, there's not so much kind of honeydew on the trees, which is their normal food source. Um, they, they'll come down if they really have to and, and will nectar on flowers at that point. So the, you can recognize the purple hair streaks, although you can't see, see the details, you can't see the colors, you, know, you can't see the shape of them. Um, you can recognize them from their behavior. It's quite distinctive. They fly, fly very fast, they kind of spiral around the, the canopy of the trees. Um, they have great undersides, which when they're in flight, it looks silvery. So if you can, if you see the purple hair streaks dashing around the trees and you've got the green of the trees behind them, you kind of, you, the overall, overall impression is of a, of a kind of a silvery effect. Um, if you see them against the sky, it's harder because they, they just look dark against the sky. Um, but yes, the, typically the males are, are dashing around and once you, once you're familiar with their behavior, um, then it's quite, quite easy to recognize them next time you see them, whether you get a good view of the actual butterfly or not. Similar species, there's, a, there's really only one similar species in Scotland, which you might confuse them with, um, and that's the white letter hair streak. Uh, so the white letter hair streak is, a, is another canopy dwelling butterfly. It uses elm versus oak. It's not a safe uh, distinguishing feature if you see a butterfly dashing around the oak. It doesn't necessarily mean it's purple hair streak and vice versa with elm because the butterflies can use other species of trees uh, for their territories, but the caterpillar food plant uh, is different. So if you're, in, if you're in a place with no elm at all, then it's unlikely to be white letter hair streak and vice versa with uh, purple hair streak. The white letter hair streak uh, perches with its wings closed. So this is the typical view, and that's that's the view you're going to get. You're, you're not going to see them basking with their wings open, uh, whereas the, the purple hair streak uh, does bask with its wings open. I'm, I'm conscious I haven't actually shown a picture of a purple hair streak yet, which I'll, I'll rectify in a couple of minutes. 
white letter hair streak is only in the borders as far as we know. So Ian Cow has been doing some amazing work tracking uh, down white litter hair streaks, which weren't known at all in Scotland a few years ago. Um, so, so Ian and others that he's recruited have been mapping white letter hair streaks, whether they've crossed the border recently or whether they've been there for a while and discovered, nobody really knows, but uh, this is the current known distribution. So if you're not in the borders um, and you're seeing these hair streaks around the tree canopy, then you're probably looking at purple hair streak. White letter hair streak flies earlier, but there is some overlap. So if you see a, a hair streak flying around the trees in June, it's more likely to be a white letter hair streak. If, if it's August, late August and September, then it's more likely to be purple hair streak. So just to rewind back to, to 2020, um, because so this time last year, I knew very little about purple hair streak. We used to go to King Clavin Woods once a year to, to, to see the butterfly. Um, because they're high up and you don't really get a good view of them. It kind of felt more like a, a box ticking exercise more than anything, just to say that you'd seen them. Uh, ne never leave with a photograph. Um, wasn't really aware of any new sites. So it was really just a question of uh, popping back to King Cliff and just to, just to see them regularly each year. So in 2020, we decided to try and improve on, on our views of uh, purple hair streaks. So we actually took a telescope, a spotting scope here, which is normally used for, for bird watching, but uh, we thought we'd give it a try. Uh, to see if we could get better views of the purple hair streaks. So this is a picture of my wife, Arno, looking through our uh, telescope. Uh, and it actually worked very well. Uh, once you could learn where the males were tending to perch, you could kind of lock onto that spot and, and wait till they return to it. And we were, we were getting some very nice views of the, of the males perching up there and even, even able to see the kind of yellowish tips to their antennae, which is fascinating when you're down on the ground and looking at them uh, through the scope up, up in the canopy. So this is this is the sort of view that uh, that we were getting. These are not my photos. These are some great photos taken by Colin Edwards down in Fife. But this is the sort of views that we we could get through the telescope. So this is the male. Uh, normally looks brown on the upper side, but when the light catches it, you get this nice bluish uh, purple shimmer to the wings. And this is a female, so it doesn't have the, the, the kind of the, the sheen on the wings, but it's got these uh, very nice purple patches which you can see from all angles. And this is the underside, uh, so it's a greyish, uh, greyish pattern overall. It's a fairly small butterfly, you know, around the size of a common blue. Um, but uh, yeah, this, this is the overall impression. You can see see all these uh, views. You know, they, they do sometimes wander around with their wings closed. Sometimes they sit and bask um, in the sunshine with their wings open in the evening. So, so we had a successful trip, better than our usual views of the butterfly. So that inspired me to kind of think maybe I could actually go and start looking and see if I could find some, some other sites. Um, the butterfly at this point was thought to be very rare, just, just a, a few kind of special bluebell woods were the only places where you could see them. Um, so I decided I would head up to another bluebell wood, which didn't have any records for the species, which is um, the Derek wood up at Blair Gary, another, another nice bluebell wood. Um, no records and on the information board there's a picture of um, a scalloped oak, oak moth but no mention at all of butterflies. It turned out that uh, it was easy to see them, there were just as many purple hair streaks there as there were at uh, King Clavin. so I was uh, quite proud of myself that I'd found one new site for the butterfly. Um, on my drive home I got even more surprises, I stopped off at a couple of places which weren't weren't even oak woods, just a few places by the road uh, where there was oak trees, stopped and had a quick kind of a very optimistic look and I, and I actually saw that the, the butterflies flying around the tops of these, uh, these other trees as well just by the roadside which uh, was, was certainly some food for thought. Uh, so um, and again that weekend out and about just walking near Burnham Station just on, on a family walk, not even really thinking about purple hysterix, but saw some oak trees and stopped to have a look. And there was purple hysterix sitting there as well. So uh, from, from being a species which I only knew of one or two sites to suddenly having seen them pretty much every time I went out, uh, that really started to make me think. Um, so I, I had to go at uh, square bashing. So just popping out just to some areas where there was no records at all in 10K square, just to see if I could add some dots on the map and pick this site here at Paddock Muir Wood, which is down by the, the banks of the Tay. Um, a little bit of a cheat because it straddles two 10K squares. So if I found the butterfly there, I could, I could put two dots on the map. And sure enough, the, the butterflies were there. So two, two 10K squares. Um, so a few, a few days later, 
I started to think I must be imagining purple hair streaks everywhere because I was, I was mowing my lawn in the garden and a small butterfly dashed past me, uh, looked very much like a purple hair streak. So I ditched the, the lawnmower, ran after this butterfly. Um, it, luckily it did land in a, in a small bush and I got just enough of a, a look at it uh, to confirm that it was indeed a purple hair streak. So why on earth there was a purple hair streak in my garden? At that point, I didn't realize that the oak tree at the front of the garden was, was holding purple hair streaks. So it was a complete mystery to me at that point. Um, and I just started to look around local villages and local woods and found purple hair streaks at uh, a village called Soka just down the road um, on the 8th of August. So I was really starting to kind of notch up the sightings and, and really thinking just how common is this species, which previously we, th we thought was quite rare. So this is a map of a, a bike ride that I did on an evening locally um, to see if I could see just how common this butterfly really is. And you can see everywhere that I've marked here in purple on my bike route is places where I saw a purple hair streak, effectively everywhere. Um, the orange highlighting is the route that I took and the purple dots is where I found the hair streaks. And this is the time when I came back home, pack, packed up my bike, had a quick look up at the oak tree outside our house and was amazed to see two or three purple hair streaks zipping around the, the tree. So really that was kind of the culmination of a, a journey of discovery from purple hair streaks being quite rare to being pretty much everywhere I looked. And I was very, very pleased to, to know that I've got purple hair streak uh, that I can look at outside the front of my garden. Uh, so I'd been posting my sightings on the Scottish Butterflies uh, Facebook group, um, which is a very active group hosted by Ian Cow. Um, a lot of good contacts to be made there. Uh, so I'd been posting my sightings and a few other people picked up on this. Um, Colin Wilson in, lives in Perth, went out and managed to find them in uh, a local site near him and managed to get this picture a lot better than any pictures that I've got. Uh, so that was great to see that my discoveries had kind of prompted other people to go out and make their own discoveries. Um, Cathy Cordwell, who lives at the Castle of Gowrie um, near Dundee, between Dundee and Perth, went out and managed to get this picture of a mating pair of purple hair streaks, uh, which was fantastic again. Um, and this kind of shows the effect that we were starting to have, you know, using social media and iRecord. The, the yellow squares on here show the known distribution of purple hair streaks at the start of 2020. Everything else is what we discovered, um, the three of us in our local area um, during 2020. So a big difference to the, uh, to the distribution maps. Uh, so as if all these discoveries weren't enough, I managed completely by chance to find a purple hair streak egg. We'd had a, we'd had a stormy night um, in the village and was just out walking around the village for my daily exercise. Um, and I'd read about the eggs, the purple hair streak eggs, thinking, you know, presuming it's something that uh, kind of expert butterfly hunters could, could find maybe down south. Um, but I did pick up a couple of twigs and just by chance managed to see this kind of little object on, the, on one of the, the windblown twigs. Um, thought it might just be a purple hair streak, prob egg, probably not, but took it home and managed to get some magnification on it and eventually convinced myself that I had in fact uh, found a purple hair streak egg. Um, went out and bought a, a better microscope. I use a USB microscope that just plugs into the computer and managed to get this shot of the egg, um, which is quite a fascinating thing. You know, I'd never really realized how interesting the eggs of butterflies are and this kind of little sea urchin type shape. Uh, so that inspired me to kind of keep looking and over the next few weeks I continued to look for the eggs and had quite a lot of success and eventually managed to accumulate quite a few. This was uh, the biggest success. I came across this, this huge oak bough off the south side of a, um, a very large tree had come down, so, which meant the whole, this whole bough was within reach. So I spent a couple of happy hours um, sifting through this and, and managing to pick up um, around 10 eggs I got in the end. This, this started to make me think, you know, maybe this is a solution to my purple hair streak photography problem. If I could actually maybe rear these uh, purple hair streaks and manage to get a picture of them shortly after they emerge from the chrysalis before releasing them again, then that might be my chance to actually get some decent photographs. Um, so so this, these eggs that I was collecting, they're all kind of rescues effectively. I didn't take any eggs off the trees, uh, just left them in their natural habitat. But uh, these were all eggs which they, the caterpillars would have perished. They, they, would, they would emerge in the spring on a dead twig with, uh, with nothing to eat. So I was happy to be able to kind of collect these eggs and, and hopefully help the butterflies as well as have this kind of potential possibility of rearing them and photographing the, the adults. 
so this is what it looks like when you when you kind of find an egg. Um, not easy to spot. This is obviously a very magnified twig, so they're, they're about about a millimeter across. Uh, so they are very small. It does take a while to to get your eye into what they look like. Uh, this is a this is one I found at Schoon Palace, which um, was a, was a new site. You know, the butterflies are not known to to occur at Schoon Palace, but now we know they do because there was an egg there. And this is a picture by Ian Cow um, with high magnification. Ian's a, a very handy photographer and managed to get this picture with his macro lens with extension tubes, I think, and just, just shows how, how interesting the eggs actually are when you get a very close view. So hatching, so I stored the eggs over the winter, uh, half of them in the fridge and half of them outside. I wasn't sure what was the best solution. Um, turns out keeping them in the fridge works very nicely. And in the spring, was kind of brought them out of the fridge and keeping an eye on them to try and see if anything could happen, see if the eggs had survived and whether there was any chance that would actually get some caterpillars emerging. Um, and this eventually is what I saw when um, checking the eggs each morning once they're out of the fridge and saw this one morning, which is a hole in the top of the egg and you can just see the, the, the kind of tiny caterpillar in there. Again, this is all one millimeter across. So this is happening under a microscope. Uh, you tend to see this kind of black shiny head moving around and then you know there's something happening. This is a, a shot of the caterpillar fully emerged from its, from its egg. Uh, so this, is, this is one that I watched under a, under a microscope for a while. It actually takes almost all day, you know, went from starting to see this to watching the caterpillar emerge can, can take hours, can take overnight, can take up to two or three days in some situations. So it's not easy to catch it, you know, you need a little bit of patience. So I'm going to try a, a video here, depending how well it works for you, probably depends on what your kind of internet connection is, but some of you may have seen this, this video before, but this is a, this is a caterpillar emerging from its egg uh, this was happening in the middle of the night. I'd left, I'd kind of had to leave it and go to bed because it had been, I'd been waiting all day for it to emerge. Um, and it hadn't emerged by kind of night time. So, so I had to leave it, uh, head off to bed. But I happened to be awake at 2.30 in the morning and wandered down to see if anything was happening. I was lucky enough just to catch this tiny little caterpillar coming out with the egg at 2.30 a.m. And I'd left it next to a fresh bud so that when it came out, it would have a, a food source. And uh, luckily enough, the, the these these caterpillars have enough uh, enough sense or enough sense of smell or whatever it is to actually go across and find food. So that's very much sped up. It took 20 minutes for all that to happen. So this was kind of a time lapse video using my iPhone. Uh, so I'd got everything arranged just to hopefully catch the moment. And, and that's what I captured. So that's around 30 times speed. So that's kind of 20 minutes of caterpillar wandering around compressed down to 40 seconds. And this is a picture taken later on with the microscope, the empty egg down here, and you can just about see the tiny caterpillar there in the inside the bud. And, and that's what happens, you know, if these first instar caterpillars, they disappear off into the bud and you're not going to see them again for a while. So the trick then is to kind of keep an eye on, on the bud and see when it emerges. And this shows the empty eggs. I'm quite interested in these the way these eggs, they have this interesting kind of mother of pearl sheen inside them which can be different colors this is kind of a brassy gold one and this was a, a green and purple one so it's it's quite interesting to see even the eggs even when they're empty they're quite an interesting thing to look at and this is a this is a caterpillar actually hatched in the fridge i managed to catch it um wandering around in the container in the fridge and i had then to figure out how to to get it onto a food source and did that with this paintbrush so this is a, a very magnified shot again i think this was a microscope shot showing this tiny one millimeter caterpillar perched on the paintbrush in the process of being transferred onto a, um, a fresh oak bud which as you can imagine is quite a delicate operation this is another of ian's picture i'd, I'd sent to ian eggs because I, I knew he'd be able to get some great images of them and he, he managed to hatch one as well so you can see this fascinating picture he got uh, and you can see the, the hairs on the caterpillar and another indication of the scale of it you know this is this oak bud is a very small thing so this tiny caterpillar on it is absolutely tiny uh, this is just to show my arrangement for for rearing them once they've hatched so we have a, an oak twig here in a bottle uh, with water to try and keep the keep the leaves succulent for a, for a while. They, they do die off quite quickly, so you do have to change the food and kind of move the caterpillars across um, from time to time before they start wandering off because they're not happy with their food supply. 
Um, but yeah, this is so this is the bottle I've attached. This this is for kind of fourth instar caterpillars. So I've attached a membrane around it so they can climb down off the bottle if they need to once I'm ready, once I'm ready to give them somewhere to pupate and then they're not trying to climb down a plastic bottle, which I, uh, I would imagine is quite tricky. Uh, and there's paper towels stuffed in the top of the bottle here to stop the, the caterpillars ending up in the water, which uh, would not be a good result. So this is the second instar caterpillar. This is what this is what you see after the, the first instar buried into the buds. Keep an eye on it for a week or two, and you you can if you're lucky you'll spot the second instar caterpillar on the outside of the bud. And you can see it's already gone through quite a significant transformation. So every stage of the transformation is to match uh, what's happening with the oak bud development. You know they, they have um, not just one set of interesting camouflage, but several go through several sets of interesting camouflage, all quite different and all differently matched against different stages of the um, of the oak buds and the developing leaves. Uh, this is a fourth instar caterpillar. Um, so you'll notice I've skipped from two to four. That's just because three and four actually look very similar. Um, but fourth is a bit more kind of attractive. The, the markings get very dark. So you can kind of get an indication here of the, of the camouflage. You can imagine that kind of wrapped around the buds as they tend to do. You can see that uh, for very similar colors and very similar markings. So this is a, probably about uh, one centimeter in size at this point. Just to, just to kind of illustrate the journey that the caterpillars go through. Here's an egg in the middle of the picture. Uh, this is an unhatched egg. This is a fourth instar caterpillar. So you can see this took about three, three and a half weeks to go from a caterpillar that emerged from that tiny egg to this size, this fourth instar caterpillar. So even before they get to the point of pupil pupating and the amazing transformation to a butterfly, they go through some fairly radical uh, transformations just as, just as they go, th go through the caterpillar stage of the life cycle. Now, this is another illustration of the camouflage. So they, as well as being very, very, uh, very cleverly camouflaged in their own right, they also uh, spin small webs which catch debris from the oak buds, uh, these little kind of fragments of the oak buds which fall off. Uh, so these, these are caught by the, the caterpillar's web and then the caterpillars tunnel into them. So you really can't tell where the caterpillar stops and where the oak tree starts um, when they get to this stage. And this is another example of a uh, Camouflage of a fourth instar caterpillar. Not easy to spot unless you know what you're looking for. Um, but I did discover that the caterpillars, they're not actually aware of their, ca their camouflage. They obviously have certain behaviors built in um, and they instinctively behave in a certain way, but these caterpillars are quite happy to kind of roost on the, on the paper towel that's stuffed into the top of the bottle. Obviously the camouflage didn't work at all here. So they're completely oblivious to the fact that they're camouflaged, but it's just something that, uh, that comes out of their behavior. So at this point, um, I've been quite successful rearing the caterpillars and I have half a dozen pupae in a, in a cage which uh, with some kind of moss and, and leaf litter, uh, the caterpillars quickly tunnel under the moss or head under a leaf. They're not too fussy, you know, they'll, they'll settle down quite quickly, but as long as they've got a little bit of cover. Um, so half a dozen of them successfully got to this stage and I'm now kind of eagerly uh, keeping an eye on them every morning just to see if uh, if we have a, an adult emergence. I was thinking there's a possibility I might be able to show, show an emergence in, in this presentation, but uh, they're still sitting tight. So it could happen any moment. I'm, I'm gonna go and check after I finished uh, this presentation and go and see, just double check that they haven't emerged, but uh, fingers crossed, all being well, if I've looked after the pupa correctly, I'll have uh, something up to half a dozen of the adult butterflies and I'll, I, will, uh, I will certainly make sure I try and get some close-up pictures of the butterfly, a pristine butterfly, once it's submerged and once they've stretched their wings and once they're, uh, once they're ready to go before I release them uh, somewhere locally. Uh, so yeah, you'll need to keep an eye on, uh, on the butterfly Facebook groups. I, as soon as I have something to report, I'll certainly be, be sharing it on there. So at this point, yes, I should apologize for the lack of actual Purple History butterfly photographs in the presentation. So that's something for next time. So 2021 plans. So um, as I mentioned, finding new areas uh, is, is, is something which uh, I want to do and I'll be very, very happy to have any, any help with this. These are some areas that I'm targeting. 
uh, areas where there are currently no records for purple hair streak at all, but I think it's very possible that we could make some exciting discoveries. Um, Northeast Angus, um, I'm sure there's there's plenty of sites, especially around the kind of South Esk and North Esk rivers, there's this kind of stretches of suitable habitat that don't have any records. The Lothians would be a big discovery, plenty of very, very good sites with oak trees, oak woods. Uh, these are a couple. It's kind of, it's strange that there's no records from Dalkeith Country Park with its 900 year old oak trees and the fantastic oak habitat. So definitely worth checking. Edinburgh itself, uh, a couple of potential sites here. Scottish borders, again, there's a very old historical record from Scottish borders and there are sites the other side in England. Um, lots of kind of potential there. Um, Stately homes is, are always there. Uh, are always a good place to target because they tend to have the best oaks you know the oaks have been there for hundreds of years very nice habitats the challenge is if they're if they're closed uh if they close at kind of the end of the afternoon and then then it's not so easy to get access uh, when the butterflies start emerging maybe another reason why the butterflies are under recorded because uh they're flying around when all the visitors have gone home um but we'll see It'll be very interesting to, to find out more east fife Currently, a, a blank spot for purple hair streaks, but uh, that, that could be that could be something. It's just lack of recording. D side and getting ambitious now. Um, we don't have any historical records from D side, but there are some fantastic orchids. So, yeah, we're going to give it a try. And I know Patrick Cook's been looking for eggs over the winter, so um, that would be a significant discovery. That would be a very very interesting dot on the map. Do have some clues already. Um, here on the right are two of my freshly emerged. Um, the eggs from caterpillars that freshly emerged. So these are kind of eggs, definitely purple hair streak eggs. On the left, this is a twig I found up in Northeast Angus at uh, Cortechy on the, on the junction of four blank 10K squares. Uh, this is an old twig off a, a branch which had obviously come off the tree a few years ago. So it was, an, it was in a little bit of a poor state with algae and uh, moss on it. But I'm pretty sure that is an old purple hair streak egg, several years old. Um, not 100% confident enough to actually record it and claim the new squares, but um, I'm very confident if we go, go back there in July and August, we'll see the adult butterflies flying around. Uh, we do have a Fife survey lined up. So this is a, a, a set of targets that we've prepared with, with um, Gillian and Elspeth in, in Fife, who are the county recorders. Uh, this shows some areas. So what I did was I looked at um, aerial photographs for nice patches of kind of woodland habitat. Um, so yeah, it's quite quick to just kind of, I, I use Bing maps because it's quite easy to switch between satellite photographs and ordnance survey maps to kind of get a good bearing for where you're at. Uh, so it's easy enough to identify promising patches of woodland. And then I switch to uh, Google Street View, which is a kind of a low level kind of camera view of the area. And you can pick out what kind of trees are there. So we've managed to settle on areas that look like good areas of woodland and confirm that they're all uh, that there are oaks there. So all this all is just done from a computer. So 2021, we'll be hoping to get some volunteers and have a training session and target uh, these areas and hopefully uh, fill in a lot of the blanks in, in Fife as well. They're quite well recorded in West Fife. So we'll, we'll do a training session in at one of these sites in West Fife at Davila Forest in towards the end of July. And then if we have a few people who then know how to kind of survey for Hedricks and what, what to look for, hopefully set people off um, improving the, the distribution maps in Fife. So one, one thing I should mention when, when searching for purple hair streaks, come, they, they, they use various species of oak and from, from uh, down south, I think all the four species of oak that we have in this country, purple hair streaks do use. My observation is that they, they only use common oak locally. We do have common oak and sessile oak around the village where I live, but I'm yet to see purple hair streaks on sessile oak. I'm yet to find eggs on sessile oak. So I think that in Scotland, at least, maybe you need the kind of common pendunculate oak for purple hair streaks. That's just a theory at this point. So, so yeah, it'll be very interesting to find out more. I, d I understand that in some parts of Scotland, uh, the Lothians, maybe D-side sessile oak is more common. So it's possible that this is affecting the distribution of the butterfly or of the recording success. So if people are going out looking for them at oak woods and they're looking at sessile oak, possibly they're not gonna be having so much luck. Yeah, it's, it's a theory, we'll see. It'd be very interesting to find out if we can find purple hair streaks in areas where, where it's sessile oak dominated. But finally, um, yes, if anyone 
would like to help with this survey and would like to help kind of fill in some of these blanks, I'd be very happy to, to hear from them and kind of share knowledge and uh, advice and maybe even come and help search. So this is my email address. So I'd be happy for, for anyone to, uh, to get in touch and yeah, let's see what we can do during 2021. Okay, thanks for listening. Thanks, Chris. That was absolutely fascinating. Uh, I hadn't seen a lot of these photos before because I don't use Facebook, so it was really nice to see the whole journey together. It was excellent. And what a beautiful butterfly. And I love the concept that it's an after work butterfly for those of us who have less time. Uh, I hope people in the borders and Lothians are feeling inspired to go out uh, searching. I certainly am. Um, I'm not too far from Dalkeith Country Park. And actually, Balkaskia Estate is one of my PhD sites, so I'll be looking there as well. Very good. So we've got a couple of questions. Um, Erica is asking, is Inverness too far north for Purple Hair Streak? Um, I would say it's worth trying anywhere. Um, so in the West Coast, I know they're up as far as kind of Fort William area, so they so they do they do extend you know fair range north, but really we don't know we don't know what the northern limit is. Uh, I know it's not been too difficult to discover them in areas where they just weren't known at all. So I would I would recommend that you know anybody who thinks they've got good oak kind of habitat, definitely give it a try. Excellent. And we have a question from uh, from Simon, one, our other speaker. I don't know if Simon wants to unmute um, and actually ask the question, since he's able to. I can do, yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Chris. That was fascinating. Um, I was just wondering, as I cycle through Scotland, whether my route and potential Purple Hair Streak sites coincide and I could do some an evening looking for Purple Hair Streaks in, in July as I come up through uh, from, I guess, Stirling, or up northwards that would be very interesting yeah yeah we should we should uh, we should look at your route and I've pick some sites and see what we can do yeah i can imagine you could make a significant uh, impact on the on the known sites doing that cool i'll drop your line thanks Great. seems like 2021 is going to be the year of the purple hair streak by the sounds of it with all this social media uh, work a comment from Nigel saying some folk in England are using UV light to survey for the hair streaked caterpillars at night as they show up very well under UV. Thanks for that, Nigel. Uh, somebody on the West Coast confirming that they are finding uh, them on sessile oaks as well. Very good. Uh, a few comments just saying absolute fantastic first class presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, let's see. Yeah, I think that's all the questions. Just, just, yeah, people commenting that it was a great presentation, that they uh, would really like to find them find them in their area. Helen saying that there's lots of oak in D-side. So yeah, fantastic. Um, are your events going to be advertised, I presume, on social media, Chris? We should look yes. out for them. Yes, certainly are. Yes, we've, we've kind of, we haven't set a date for the kind of the five training session yet, just because it's obviously very weather dependent. So we're, we're kind of looking at the last week in July and yeah, we'll, we'll try and use social media to kind of get the word out uh, once we can see that there's going to be decent weather. So yeah, we'll um, just, people just need to, to keep an eye on that and I'll, I'll get in touch with uh, Gillian or, Smith or, or myself uh, close to the time, just when we can confirm a date. Fantastic. And if you send the details to me as well, we'll get it put on the website for people who don't use social media. Um, fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for speaking to us and telling us about your Purple Hair Streak adventures. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So, Thanks very much. <laughs> um, our, next, um, our next item on the agenda. If you've ever been to one of our Scottish gatherings, you'll know that last night's moths are a particular highlight of the day. In fact, moths via Zoom, I think, have really taken off during lockdown. And I've managed to secure our moth correspondent, Nigel Voden, for um, another moth ID session today. I'm sure you'll be well aware of Nigel's expertise already, so I'll hand you over. Anything good in your moth trap last night, Nigel? Thank you very much, Bethany. Um, Yes, uh, last night was actually the first decent night um, for a long time. Um, so many of you will be aware that the weather this uh, last six weeks or so has been unseasonably cold. And um, if uh, any of you are uh, moth trappers yourselves, 
you will probably have experienced very low catches through much of April and May. Um, it's never normally a particularly busy time for garden mothing, um, but this year has been particularly bad right across the UK, um, from the very south of England to the very northern tip of Scotland, people have been reporting much lower catches than normal. Um, but uh, fortunately, the weather is starting to warm up a little bit. Um, and last night, uh, I managed to um, get a trap out, two traps out in the garden and one on a nearby uh, lowland wet heath site. And in the garden, I had 22 species. On the heath site, I had 29 species. Um, just to give you an idea, in comparison to this time last year, when we had very warm weather in the second half of May, I think I had 85 species one night in the garden. So looking at only about a quarter of the diversity of this time last year, but relative to two years ago, um, not, uh, not quite so poor. I think two years ago, I think I was getting about sort of 35 species or so a night at the end of May. So I've got a range of things laid out on the table in front of me here, um, and uh, I'll see how many of them will actually behave uh, to show you because uh, some of the geometers in particular are quite flighty and sensitive to movement. So as I try to put them underneath the microscope camera here, they may start fluttering about. Um, so I think someone said never work with children in live animals. Uh, we'll see how we go with live moths. I've got quite a few species, so I'm not going to go into a massive amount of detail with each one. It's more going to be a case of just showing you the, uh, the moths um, and, uh, and hopefully you'll enjoy them. So we'll start off with this white ermine. Um, I should say most of these moths that I'm going to show you tonight are sort of fairly generalist species. Uh, most of them use a wide range of food plants and most of them will be species you can realistically expect to trap. Um, in most gardens um, you know, throughout, throughout our uh, branch area. If there's anything a little bit special, a little bit more um, uh, in, in terms of habitat it uses or food plants it requires, I will mention that. If I don't mention anything in particular, you can assume it's probably a generalist species that you can reasonably expect to catch in your own garden. So this is a white ermine, very easy to identify, white with um, the sort of uh, black spotted pattern all over it. Um, there's one other similar species, the buff ermine, but that's kind of yellowish in terms of uh, the ground coloration. Um, very pretty moths um, with their nice sort of winter fluffy thorax. Um, I don't know if I can show you underneath it at all. No, that's not actually going to work. So that's white ermine. And what should we try next? So this is a nut tree tussock. I don't get very many of these in my garden and usually only one or two a year. So this actually came from the, um, uh, the nearby uh, heath site where I trapped last night. They're quite easy to identify as well. This sort of two-tone coloration, kind of brownish uh, front half and then uh, sort of frosty, creamy, gray um, uh, second half of the wing. Let's go for this one next. This is a very common species in gardens at this time of year. This is the heart and dart. So let me just show it either our way up. So heart and dart can often be very numerous in gardens. Sometimes I can get uh, a few dozen in a night. Um, quite a large, long brownish moth with uh, two distinct long black uh, marks um, just below the thorax there, which is it gets its name from um, the dart markings effectively. Um, and then you can just about see um, on its face, it's got sort of dark eyebrows. Uh, if you look at it head on, you can see them easily. But from here, you can just about see them looking down on top. So that's heart and dart. Let's go for you next. A slightly more unusual species this is shoulder stripe wainscot. Some of the wainscots can be quite difficult to identify, um, but shoulder stripe wainscot is relatively straightforward. 
Um, it's got uh, typical Wayne's got sort of coloration, but it's got these two black uh, fine lines that come down from the thorax, and that's what it gets its name from, shoulder striped. Um, it, it's relatively early flying compared to most wainscots um, from sort of mid-May uh, through to the end of June. Shoulder striped wainscot. I'm purposely ignoring all the geometers at the moment, but I'll try one of those in a bit. And this is going to be brown rustic. This is Another quite common guard species for me. Um, when they're fresh, they're quite nicely marked, although they're rather brown overall. Um, they've got these black wavy lines going across them. As they wear, those uh, wavy lines and the markings really disappear and you end up with just a very brownish looking moth. The pale notches on the leading edge, um, you can see about four or five of them on each wing there. They're a good identification mark, um, even when they're worn. That brown rustic. Uh, let's be brave and try. Oh no, that's not worked. I've knocked it. Uh, I was going to try a geometer and I've knocked it as I was trying to move it. Uh, let's try this one. So this is actually a spring species. Um, this is probably the latest I've ever recorded one before. This is called shoulder stripe. And it's getting a little bit tatty, it's lost quite a few scales already, which isn't surprising being as usually record these um, from sort of mid-March, mid-late March through till mid, maybe late April, very occasionally into early May. I've never seen one anywhere near as late as this. So just indicates how late this spring is. Um, the one of these is still on the wing. Um, they're very pretty moth when they're fresh. Um, this one's got a little bit worn, but that's shoulder stripe. for one that everyone should know now. And it's so big, I don't think it's actually going to fit on the screen fully. Peppered moth, um, one of the most famous and well-known moths, um, uh, even outside mothing circles, um, taught in biology lessons at, uh, at school throughout the UK, I think. Um, comes in three different colour forms, a, a pale, an intermediate and a dark. This is a pale one. The, the dark colour form became very, uh, very common and prevalent during the Industrial Revolution when everything was coated in soot, including tree trunks. Um, so this black and white camouflage no longer worked. Um, the, the moth was readily visible to, to predators, such as small birds pick them off, but they couldn't see the, the dark form um, because that became camouflaged against the, uh, the soot covered trunks and walls of, um, of that era of the UK. And uh, virtually all the pepper moths in the UK at that point became, um, became uh, the dark form. Um, these days, uh, obviously the, the atmosphere has been cleaned up to an extent um, and uh, it's reverted back to the, uh, the, the light and intermediate forms being the most common ones. Um, I've personally never ever seen a dark form yet. Now that's peppered moth. I nearly missed this one. It wasn't in the trap in the garden. It was actually hiding in the grass nearby. Um, this is the first hawk moth I've seen this year. And this is uh, not usually the one I see first. This is small elephant hawk moth. Um, I usually see poplar first and then probably elephant after that and then small elephant, but uh, this year it's small elephant is the first one. Um, similar colour scheme to elephant moth, um, but the patterning is different and they are much smaller and they're not quite as gaudy in terms of the pink and the green. Uh, they usually only get um, two or three a year in the garden, so it's quite pleasing to see one already this year. That's small elephant hawk moth. for this one. I don't know if I'm going to be able to take the lid off this one very easily. It's quite active. Let's see what happens. 
Um, this is one that all you butterfly surveyors will be more familiar with, um, but maybe surprised to know that it also comes to, to light at night. Um, it's a cinnabar, of course, and uh, now I'm trying to actually show it off. It's not interested in sitting still. Um, so I apologize for its behavior. Uh, yes, yeah, so cinnabars, uh, day flying, and the caterpillars are uh, familiar to everyone feeding on ragwort, but um, they also fly at night quite happily and, and readily come to light. I get a few in my garden, but uh, this is from the heath site from last night where, um, where it's a very common species. Um, absolutely unmistakable, just in case you aren't familiar with them, with the black forewings, um, reddish uh, uh, hindwings, um, reddish spots and stripe on the forewing as well. So that's a cinnabar. Uh, it's actually going to settle down now. Let's see if I can turn him over a little bit. There we go, it's a side on view. Right, what should we go for next? Uh, this is probably the, um, the least well known moth that I caught in the, uh, the trap last night at home. This is a marbled coronet, which is, tends to be a bit more of a coastal species. Um, I get a few of them each year, but this is perhaps um, of all the species I caught in my garden last year, uh, last night, sorry, um, the one that perhaps is going to be least likely to show up in, 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 uh, in the majority of gardens anyway. Um, a very pretty sort of greeny, blacky colour pattern with white. Um, quite distinctive. Uh, you can see easily how it gets its, uh, its name marbled. Um, rather beautiful little moths. Very pleased to see my first one last night. That's marbled coronet. Um, right, I've got a few prominents. Um, see any of them that are sitting particularly nicely. So let's see how we get on. Uh, we'll start with this one, lesser swallow prominent. Prominence are one of my favourite families of moths. Beautiful shapes, often very distinctive, attractive markings. So this is lesser swallow prominent. Um, it's very similar to swallow prominent. The way you separate them is the, um, the white line, um, sort of uh, dash, that you can see um, on the uh, the trailing edge of the wing, that's the bit nearest to the body. Um, well, that's a swallow prominent, it's relatively short. Um, swallow prominent is much longer. Um, tend to catch a lot more lesser swallow prominents than swallow prominents, um, both at home and in the field. Um, this is a birch feeder usually. Um, so the birch forests of, of Scotland, it can be quite a common species. So that's lesser swallow prominent. Conscious of time, I'm probably not going to get through all these, so I'm just selectively picking the ones that I think are going to be either most well behaved or the best to look at. So let's try this pebble prominent. I'm not going to be able to take the lid off of this one because of the angle he's sat at, um, but this is a close relative of the, um, of the lesser swallow prominent. This is pebble prominent. Um, again, the markings for this species are pretty unmistakable. Um, this, can, this could turn up in your garden quite, quite happily. Um, they are a fairly generalist species, very widespread across our region. That's pebble prominent. And I would like to show you one of the thorns from last night. Now, I don't know how this is going to work because of the way they sit. Um, I'm not sure how well it's going to focus with the microscope. Let's have a go anyway. Uh, so this is a lunar thorn. So they rest um, in a position so they're, they're leaf mimics, dead leaf mimics effectively. They rest unusually with uh, a moth with the wings held up high above the body, almost like a butterfly. In fact, early thorn, which I have a one of here, actually rests with the wings held together, which is exactly like a butterfly and very much unlike a moth. But this is lunar thorn, um, which is named after um, four lunar marks um, on the or four half moon marks on the uh, one on each of the wings, two on the hind wings, two on the four wings. And if I try and turn it on its side so you can get a bit of an idea of what it looks like. There we go, I think that's probably about as good as I'm going to get. Um, you can see the, the lunar marks there um, and um, the scalloped uh, trailing edge to the wings, um, which helps with that leaf 
a dead leaf mimicry from all the beautiful moths. Uh, let's try let's try this little guy here. So this is a, a macro that looks like it's going to be a micro based on its size. So this is least black arches. It's one of the smallest macro moths around. Um, but quite distinctive, basically a white uh, ground coloration with black cross lines. Um, flies at this time of year into June. Um, can be quite numerous in, in, in certain locations, um, but the size often fools people. It's, it's as I say, it's, it's not much larger than some micros and uh, the beginner authors will be looking in the wrong book. They'll be looking in the micro guide instead of the macro guide. So it's a good one to learn early on to, um, to avoid that mistake. That's the least black arches. And let's try this one. This is one of the carpet moths, broken barred carpet. Now this is a species which I don't ever record in the garden, but I always record at this, heath, this heathland trap site that I was at last night. Just about managed to get into a position where we can see it without opening the lid. So this is broken barred carpet. Um, so, so named because the central crossbar um, is usually has a break in it. This one, the break is quite indistinct. Sometimes it's much more distinct than this. They are a little bit variable. Um, uh, rather than that, rather pretty little uh, geometers, these ones is broken barred carpet. And let's see how we get on with this one. This is a large geometer. Probably struggled to get all of it in in the picture. This is scalloped hazel, kind of sort of a bit of a dead leaf mimic with its scalloped trailing edge and brownish coloration, um, and sort of slightly different uh, central cross band in terms of coloration. Um, again, this is a relatively early flying species, um, May and June, scalloped hazel. And I think I'm going to wrap it up after this last one, which is a rather special moth, which I found yesterday when I was up near Aviemore. And I was woken up, unfortunately. This is a sweet gale moth. This is uh, quite a rare species. Um, it lives only in um, parts of the Highlands and west of Scotland and Western Ireland. Uh, it feeds on, or the larvae feed on heather and bog myrtle primarily. Uh, so it has quite a limited distribution and within that distribution it's quite scarce. It's, um, it's not an easy species to catch up with. This is the very first one I've ever seen in the UK. I have caught it before in Croatia, um, but I was, I was out looking yesterday for small dark yellow underwing, um, which is a, an even rarer species. I didn't find that, but I was rewarded with the sweet gale moth. Um, which I was very pleased about. This is a male and you can see the whitish hindwing poking out. The females have got a darker hindwing and a little bit larger. Uh, so definitely by far the rarest moth I've ever shown live on one of these uh, occasions and um, uh, definitely the rarest of the bunch you've seen this morning. So I'll wrap it up there and hand you back to Epiphany. Thank you very much. Thanks Nigel, that was brilliant as usual. Good variety there. Uh, and you said you, you caught around, uh, was it about 60 species last night? Um, in total, yeah, I haven't worked because it was across two different sites, so I haven't totaled it up, but um, probably uh, probably about 40 to 45 in total, somewhere around okay. there. Great. Any questions for Nigel before we move on? We're running a little over, so if there are no questions, we'll move on. Don't see any. I'm sure everybody enjoyed it. It's always a highlight of the day. Yeah, people saying thank you. Excellent. Um, so our final speaker of the day uh, is Hannah Imlach, who is an incredibly talented visual artist. I first attended a talk by Hannah a couple of years ago where she spoke about some amazing sculptures that she created in the Flow Country. And then the other day, I just happened to find out that um, not only is she a fellow PhD student at Edinburgh University, but she's doing some work on sculpture to do with moths. So how could I not invite her to speak? Uh, I'm very excited to hear about this. Over to you, Hannah. 
Thank you very much. Um, can I just check that you can see my screen okay? Yep, I can see it and I can hear you. Perfect. Oh, apologies. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a fascinating morning so far. And um, as a brand new moth enthusiast, I've just been loving every presentation. So I'm really pleased to be here and to be able to contribute. Um, so I'd like to, um, in this short talk, just introduce what I do, introduce my art practice, speak about this ambitious project that I've been working on as part of my PhD for the last um, two years almost, and then talk about how it led me to MOFs and this new artwork that I'm building at the moment in the studio, which I'm calling a MOF Encounter Sculpture, and it's going to be installed in the Loch Lomond Nature Reserve in July. So I'll come to that at the end. But I'll start with this slide is the front page of my website, and it gives an overview of some of the artworks that I've been working on for the last 10 years. So I have a research-led sculptural practice. I work in sculpture and photo photography mainly, um, and all my works are inspired by specific ecological contexts. I've always been fascinated by nature and, I, and through my art practice, I'm able to explore geology and um, peatland plant life and um, glacial landscapes and, um, and now the world of moths. So, so it's, um, it's a wonderful vehicle for me to, to learn and to participate in some amazing um, research and conservation. So in my art practice, I've all, often sought out opportunities to work within specialist communities of environmental knowledge, um, often as artists in residence. And my projects have been really driven by the fieldwork experiences. So sustained on-site exploration and the knowledge generating practices of the individuals and the communities that I've been able to work within. So then these fieldwork experiences are, um, there we go, it's working. These fieldwork experiences allow me to build a bank of creative, scientific and archive based sources, exploring the specific qualities of each of the sites that I um, choose to make work about. And this combined environmental uh, research material becomes my source material for sculpture and is fed by ongoing dialogue with project collaborators, um, model making, drawing and material experimentation. So the outputs of my projects are primarily site specific sculpture, um, but they also include film and photography, exhibitions, workshops and publications. And these are some of the works that I created as part of an artist residency working with the RSPB up in Forsenard in the Flow Country. And I was tasked with making artworks inspired by the ecology and restoration of Blanket Bog. To, to whisk through some other previous works, um, this is a piece that I made with a team of uh, research scientists at the University of Edinburgh in their Changing Oceans group. And this was looking at deep sea cold water coral reefs off the west coast of Scotland. And this is a piece inspired by community initiated renewable energy transition, which is another one of my interests um, that I've explored on the Isle of Egg in North Uist um, and in Aberdeen. So like a bit of me, um, said, I'm also a current PhD student in the School of Geosciences at the University of Edinburgh. And um, my PhD is a bit unusual because I'm a, an arts practitioner working within an environmental research community. Um, but it's also, um, it's also unusual because it's done through um, partnership with the RSPB, which is the RSPB's first arts humanities supported studentship. They've done a lot of PhDs supporting um, researchers in this, uh, working in the sciences, but this is the first time they've worked in partnership uh, with someone from the arts or humanities. Um, and my project is based at their Loch Lomond Nature Reserve, which is a relatively new reserve, um, which sits at the mouth of the River Endrick. So the reserve encompasses wet woodland, Western Atlantic oakwood, peatland fen, grassland and wildflower meadow. It's a really fascinating mosaic of different habitats. And it's home to um, amazing communities of migratory birds, beetles, butterflies and moths, alongside mammals like otter, deer, badger and pine marten. So my research aims to creatively explore both this reserve and it, 
um, and its diverse ecologies and the conservation practices that are undertaken there to observe, record and preserve these habitats. And I'm investigating what role site-specific sculpture um, in the context of a nature reserve can have in strengthening what I've called multi-species connection. So how may an artwork help people to become more engaged um, with some of these species, which in the Loch Lomond Nature Reserve are not always so easy to see. So how do we help the public to engage with forms of wildlife that may be hard to detect or happening at scales um, or cycles or times of the day, which are not usually visible? So in my PhD so far, um, I participated in field work on site and um, working with the RSPB staff to um, to do dawn goose roost surveys, breeding bird surveys, um, moth trapping and identification. Um, and I continue to be really inspired by the species specific attent attentiveness practiced by um, the staff there and the kind of tools and practices of conservation. That's a big um, inspiration for my artwork. So last year, obviously, as we all experienced, um, the COVID-19 pandemic um, completely disrupted the field work that I had been planning to do on site in the spring. And um, as the RSPB kind of had to, many of the staff were furloughed and conservation activities during what is usually the busiest time with breeding bird surveys and um, uh, management of invasive species, all that activity was paused. So it was an unusual time and I began a conversation um, with Assistant Warden Luke Wake while we were both stranded, me not able to, to continue my research at the university and, and him being the only person left at the Loch Lomond Nature Reserve. And during this time we began to talk about moth trapping because um, although Luke was wasn't able to do all the other types of surveying that he would usually have been doing, he was able to do moth trapping. And as we've heard previously this morning, it was a wonderful year, wonderful um, spring and summer for moth trapping. And, and we would have weekly conversations where we would discuss um, what he was dis um, encountering in his trap, how he was learning about the processes of identification. Um, and I was experiencing it um, mediated through him. So I thought I would read to you um, a short piece of text that I wrote um, many months after I was um, initially spoke to Luke about moth trapping when I was first able to access the site. So this is a text um, that I wrote about my first moth encounter. As I tip the gold and fuchsia elephant hawk moth slowly onto my hand, its wings remained folded tuck points touching its large abdomen, which is colored by a thick brush, brush stroke of deep pink. Compound eyes, great orbs protruding from either side of its head are tinted green, darkening towards the center, each minuscule compartment just visible. The pink fur around its eyes radiates towards a, lo a long, tightly coiled proboscis. Unloading a moth trap requires a gentle touch. Each box Egg boxes are lifted slowly from the darkness and rotated in the sunlight to reveal moths and other insects nestling in their recesses. Luke, assistant warden at RSPB Loch Lomond, calls out more familiar species as we work. Antler moth, drinker. Some are highly colored like tropical birds. Others resemble faded tapestries with flaking scales creating bright bulb patches around their crown. We usher unidentified moths into clear plastic containers comparing wing, antenna, abdomen, and underside patination to intricate scale drawings within the field guide. I study the detail of observational distinctions, minute kidney marks, faint pointillist bars, barely perceptible differences in color saturation and wing curvature. The closest comparison I have for this level of scrutiny is time spent condition checking artwork, noting and plotting individual grains of dust or an eyelash caught within a frame. Sitting with the elephant hawk moth felt as if I was holding a hummingbird caught in suspension. I could appreciate the minute details of its form, tiny reactions to stimuli, quivering antennae and wing readjustments. 
Unlike any pinned specimen, this was the pulsing energy of life. Flight was possible at any point, and some took wing, corkscrewing overhead before veering away into an impenetrable bramble patch at the edge of the woodland. Gone. So I'm sure that's very familiar for many of you, um, but it was a wholly new experience for me, and it was um, it had a particularly strong effect um, inspiring this artwork that I'm currently working on. So following, um, following these initial experiences of moth trapping, I became fascinated, I became a keen macro moth uh, photographer. Um, and each time I was able to visit site, I um, was able to unload a trap. And, and I'm still the very beginning of my journey of learning about moths, but I find them truly fascinating. So I thought I would, I would share um, this book, which some of you may know of. This is a book I've read recently, which has really extended my fascination with moths, and particularly with the moth's sensory world or, the, or their umwelt, which is the, the kind of perception bubble in, in which um, they experience, um, which they live their lives and experience their habitat. So this is a quote by the author Matthew Gandhi from his book, Moth. And this is my favorite text that I've read about the sensory world of moths. So I'll, I'll perhaps just read this to you as well. To imagine the world of moths is to step outside the realm of human perception, if such an imaginative leap is possible, and encounter colors beyond our visible spectrum, along with other kinds of sensory stimuli we can only guess at. The sensory world of moths is most probably a synesthetic space in which acoustic, haptic, and olfactory realms are interwoven beyond the parameters of the merely visual. There is evidence, for example, that some pheromones emit visible wavelengths, so these may have multisensory behavioral effects. If we could step outside the limits of human vision, as Stan Brackage has suggested, we would have to imagine a world alive with incomprehensible objects and shimmering with an endless variety of movement in innumerable graduations of color. To notice moths and make subtle visual differentiations between similar species or spot their cryptic patterns resting against the bark of trees is a process of unlearning the degree of sensory elimination that characterizes everyday life. So I hope you enjoy that quote as much as I do. I have it pinned above my desk. Um, and this is um, one of the works referenced in that quote by Stan Brackage um, from 1963. And this is a film he made without using a camera about moths and their life world by um, capturing um, plant material and moth wings. Although he, I must say he didn't kill any moths in the making of this work um, in the film that's then projected um, into the camera. So this, this work is called Moth Light. If you want to look it up, it's available to watch online. So these photos, um, I'll go by quickly, are from a much more recent visit to Loch Lomond when I was, I was able to return a couple of weeks ago for the first time in over six months. Um, and these are photos just um, exploring my fascination with how moths are mimics and shapeshifters and how they camouflage themselves. Um, they are, um, yes, they, they, keep, they keep fascinating. Um, so I would like to pivot now to talk about the artwork that I have been developing. So over the last 10 months, since my initial um, experiences of opening the moth trap. I've been working with a specially created working group uh, made up of RSPB wardens and ecologists, volunteers, county moth recorders, um, and those from the RSPB who work in public engagement and communication. And I've been developing an artwork in dialogue with them um, that is about my experience and, and to engage others with the world of moths. So this um, so in our meetings about the artwork, we've discussed um, artwork designs, materials, we've discussed moth behavior, um, ecology and ethics, um, visitor experience and forms of interpretation. And the, this, this dialogue has really informed the shape of the artwork. 
And my idea is to create an artwork that engages both humans and moths. So I'm calling it a multi-species artwork. It's for, it's for, not just for humans, it's for moths as well. And it's, um, it's a large shelter like sculpture that people can, can go inside. It'll be like being inside your moth trap. Um, so I've taken inspiration from um, both the forms of traditional moth traps, but also um, a structure called a kota or a goatee, which is from the um, indigenous Sami people um, of Northern Scandinavia. And this structure, a bit like a Scottish bothy, is made as a space for a human shelter and um, gathering. So I've intended um, this sculpture to act as a gathering space for humans and moths, for people to have a close encounter that wouldn't otherwise be um, possible to, to try and open up the privileged experience that um, moth trappers have. Um, so the artwork, you can see here a 3D model of it, is being built at the moment. It has an a lightweight aluminium frame, which you can see in black. It has um, thin wooden panels that are removable that have a stretched mesh between them. It has a ground uh, platform, which um, has lots of uh, compartments that moths can nestle down into so that there's no um, danger of them being trodden on. It has an uh, internal stand, which I intend to fill with um, night flowering moth food plants. Um, and then at the top, you can see there's a cone, which is the aperture entry point for the moths. And then above that, there's a sphere, which is where the ultraviolet light will be positioned within. And this is like a, a moon almost, um, and a reference to um, the fact that moths are thought to, in part, navigate or orientate themselves by the moon and the stars. So the sculpture goes through several phases. It starts like this, illuminated um, on the first night with the side panels closed. And then in its second form, the side panels open and the moths are able to um, perhaps with the light off, feed more naturally and, and exit the structure and, the, and their own time. So this artwork, the moth coater, uh, will be installed in the Loch Lomond Nature Reserve in July this year. And over the weekends in July, you'll be able to book a slot to either see um, one of three events. The first one is illumination. So when the sculpture in its first position, the second one during the day, you can come and see um, if those moths can nestled within the sculpture. And then the third one, um, which is called release, uh, you'll be able to come and sit in and around the artwork as the side panels are lowered and um, moths hopefully emerge and start to kind of exit the structure. So I hope that it offers um, a different type of experience with moths in their habitat and that it can bring new audiences and new enthusiasm to these amazing creatures, which I have just discovered myself. So this is the, the site. So I'm installing it in a beautiful part of um, woodland, a woodland trail in the RSPB Loch Lomond Reserve, which is um, kind of both peaceful, but also um, um, accessible to, to a broad audience. So if you are interested in experiencing the artwork, please do keep a, a lookout and um, it will be, uh, information about the artwork will be released shortly on the RSPB Loch Lomond website and on social media, on, also on my social media and the booking, the booking page will be released in the next um, few weeks. So um, thank you very much. I, um, yes, I hope some of you can come. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. That was really, really interesting. I think this kind of uh, interdisciplinary work between art and science is so important. If we're really going to address the biodiversity crisis, uh, it's so important that we engage all different kinds of people. And many people are really attracted to very visual or sensory experiences. So um, it was really interesting. We don't normally have talks like this in our program, so it was absolutely fantastic. Um, people in the comments saying it looks great and good luck with your project. Um, amazing idea, very creative. 
do uh, do drop me an email when your event listing is advertised so that we can help you uh, spread the word through our social media accounts. Um, any questions for Hannah? Let me check the question box. Nothing in there. Well, I have a question because uh, well, it's really nice to hear from somebody who's just starting their moth journey. So I have to ask you, do you have a favorite moth yet? <laughs> Um, it's a good question. I, I think I was starstruck by the elephant hawk moth when I first saw it. I, I think I took, I don't know, 200 photographs of it, like a, a glamour shoot, because I just thought it was the most charismatic, beautiful thing that I'd ever seen. It was like holding a hummingbird. I was really amazed. Um, I, the white ermine that I, that I just um, photographed for the first time a couple of weeks ago, I, I thought that was really beautiful. And I'm a, I'm a fan of the artist, Sarah Gillespie, who, who does beautiful mezzotint prints of moths. And, and I knew the white ermine from her artwork, but to see it in the flesh, that was beautiful. Um, I also, when the moth trapping was not uh, very favorable a couple of weeks ago, when there was still frost on the ground, I was able to catch a couple of carpet moths, um, one that was called water carpet and one that was called flame carpet. So that was quite a nice day. I was rewarded with this yin yang fire water like, <laughs> moths. I thought that was, um, I think their, their names and their forms um, and their colors just continually inspire. Yeah, and that's a very good point. Their names are so amazing as well. Even just the names, yeah. Brilliant, any other questions? Oh, there's one here. Do you think your art could help people who have a fear of moths to see them in a different light? This is an excellent question um, because people, moths elicit a strong reaction in people. Um, I suppose dissimilar to butterflies, there are a lot of people who, who have a moth phobia. Um, and I don't think the artwork I'm creating is for the people that have a moth phobia. I don't want it to be a torture. <laughs> torture chamber for them um I don't, i'm not sure if that kind of um, total immersion is uh, like shock therapy is, is potentially a good idea i definitely don't want people swiping around or or kind of causing any damage to moths through fear of their own so um but i think that if someone was slightly tentative or unsure they could approach the artwork and walk around the perimeter slowly and get closer to it and kind of um, ease their way into that experience. I think that um, I think that people perhaps have a fear because they have never really encountered them and they've never had that moment of wonder. And I think um, hopefully the artwork is transformative in that it can provide that moment of amazement where you have your first encounter because as we all know, those those first experiences can be so transformative and they can and they can motivate our behavior to um, for our whole lives to become conservationists and enthusiasts. I'm sure everybody here had a moment, um, a first moment of, of encounter that they remember and hold dear and that has continued to motivate what they do. So I, I just hope that the artwork can perhaps um, elicit a few of those, one or two of those moments. Absolutely, fantastic. Uh, Nigel in the comments saying, Great stuff, Hannah. I hope it infuses and signs up a few more recorders and opens people's eyes, which I very much agree with. Um, yeah, other people saying really interesting. It would be lovely to have something like that in Edinburgh. I was thinking, you know, I was um, when Simon was giving his talk this morning, I loved the idea of the butterfly sculptures that people had to go and search for. I thought that was really nice. So, yes, fantastic. So um, there's no other questions. I will close the meeting for today. Uh, we've had some fascinating topics and I hope you feel just as inspired as I do for a new and hopefully a slightly more normal year this year. I feel particularly inspired by all the things we could be doing in our urban environments to both conserve butterflies and engage people, uh, maybe even with arts as, as we've seen. I'll definitely be putting out my moth trap soon and I'll also definitely be going on a purple hair streak adventure of my own. A massive thank you to all of our speakers and to the attendees for giving up your Saturday morning to join us. Please do keep in touch and let us know what you get up to over the summer. Um, but for now, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you for coming. 
I'll be signing off now and we will get any slides sent out to you as well. And uh, we'll let you know when the recording is up as well. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a lovely weekend.